Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's 10 o'clock, uh, and so it's time to start. Uh, my name is Ilya Nimenman, and I am the organizer of uh, this workshop, one in the series. Oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's 10, 10 o'clock, o'clock uh, and so it's time, uh, time to start. start. Uh, my, uh, name my name is Ilya Nimenman, 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 and I am, I am the, the organizer. Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock. Good morning, everybody. Okay, let's try again. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, Emory TMLS workshop on understanding the role of uh, okay, let's try again. Uh, well, uh, I hope the third time is a charm. Okay, we're trying again. Um, welcome to the Emory TMLS workshop, uh, Theory and Modeling of the Living Systems workshop on understanding the role of quantitative theory in uh, biology. My name is Ilya Nimenman. I'm one of the organizers of this workshop. 
um, you can see the schedule for the workshop uh, right on your screen right now. We'll start with me for the remaining few minutes of what I've allotted to myself. Then each of the speakers gets uh, 20 minutes of this. 10 minutes goes for the speaker um, himself or herself for the actual talk, and then 10 extra minutes for questions. Um, we will take questions first from the panel, from the other speakers that are here on Zoom with us. And then after that, if there is time, we'll take questions from you in the audience in the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, what you should realize is that there is about 20 seconds delay between what happens here in the Zoom room and what you see there on um, uh, on on Twitter, uh, oh, sorry, on uh, YouTube. And therefore, um, you should start posting your questions as soon as you have them. Do not wait for a talk to finish because by the time you see the talk finished, we'll probably be on to the next talk, right? So post the questions as soon as you as, as soon as you have them. Um, I also would like to announce that there is two next workshops in the series, in the TMLS series scheduled for October 29th. We have principles of size control in living systems across scales. And then for December 4th, we have a joint workshop between the TMLS and the Simons Emory Consortium on Motor Control. What do neural dynamics have to say about neural computation? And do we know how to listen? Okay, with that, let me move to sort of uh, try to explain how this particular workshop you are sitting in uh, came about and what do I hope to achieve with this workshop. Um, so the uh, theory in biology is often, not always, of course, but often semi-quantitative, right? We know that sort of simple theories produce some patterns and features. For example, there might be a phase transition and we're capturing it you know, correctly in biological data and they resemble experiments but they remain approximate almost you know, by design to account for biological variability. Right? At the same time, we can account for all of those details of, you know, and feed the data maybe sometimes extremely precisely by complex mechanistic models, which account for all of the details, but these models are usually not robust. And you know, everybody knows the quote from von Neumann that with four parameters, one can fit an elephant. Right? Um, even our beloved examples of theory in biology are not quite what we think they are. So if you look at the Uriadil Brook experiment and you um, see whether their model that they develop predicts the actual distribution of the number of surviving colonies across the experiments, they do, do not quite match, right? Theory is not quantitatively precise. Question Huxley equations at the same time do not produce the shape of the action potential that is exactly a match of what you would get in the giant axon. They're similar, but not exactly the same. And even you know, closer to home nowadays, you know, there are all sorts of COVID models that many of our friends have contributed to, and they differ from each other by a factor of a few at best. And usually they actually do not predict the real infection numbers in, in, in real populations, right? So are these deviations important? Uh, and what can we do about them if they are important? Can we actually develop theories that predict uh, that, that which would allow us the predictions to be so precise that they can be plotted on the same plot as the data. And so why can't we do this generally and what can we do about this? There is a few thoughts that I had when organizing these workshops. The first one is, first of all, it's not clear what to put on the axis. So for example, you know, how do you put a mutation or a species on a horizontal axis? And you know, uh, what we can do here is maybe we can ask our experimental friends to develop real valued perturbations rather than just uh, simple you know, knockout. Yes, it's hard, but maybe possible to do. Uh, another thing to keep in mind that the role of theory is not in predicting everything. No theory, even you know, in traditional physical context ever predicts everything. The role is to propose the next experiment. And the idea here is that not all details matter, but some details actually do matter, right? And so in this context, and even semi-quantitative theories can rule out whole classes of mechanisms. You don't need to be extremely precise to rule out entire, an entire set of ideas. Right? Pushing this even further, since not all details matter, maybe what we should be doing more is focusing on those things that they do, but then focusing on them precisely with error bars. If we are predicting something, then we should stand by it. Right. So is the mismatch between Hodgkin Huxley and the action potential really that important? Maybe not, and maybe therefore it's not a big deal. Uh, Lurie Dillbrook you know, analysis actually predicts and presents the relative probability in the tails for two different Lamarckian and, and, and Darwinian theories. And it does that quite well, even if it cannot predict the entire shape of the tail. Some COVID models that we are all familiar with now 
or heard about now correctly predict the relative importance of various interventions, even if they cannot predict the details of the of the um, uh, progression of the disease. Right? And then there is yet another possibility where sort of nowadays theory uh, may be um, maybe becoming more precise is that by virtue of large numbers of the statistical physics like theories where we're not modeling a single channel, but we're modeling you know, many of them, not a single neuron, but many of them, maybe those theories actually could make it easier to predict those details that uh, matter. Uh, and um, um, this is what we, the workshop is designed to do. Personally, I believe that we need to take our own work very seriously. That is, we should choose what it is that we would like to predict carefully and then make predictions quantitative about the thing that we've chosen to predict and then stand by those predictions, put them with error bars and stand by them. But I think that some of the other predictors here, uh, other presenters in this workshop will have very, very different opinions. And I would like really to understand what is this, the, the breadth of opinions that we um, all either share or do not share. And I'm looking forward to hearing the thoughts of, this, of the presenters. Uh, on this basically main questions of the workshop, right? Should we aim at quantitative predictions with, with our theories? Should we aim to plot these predictions and experiments on the same axis? And what is needed in order to make this happen more frequently than it really does? What you will notice in the lineup of the speakers is that the entire parts of biology are not represented among the speakers today. For example, um, the aspects of protein science or Mechanobiology are not represented because, in some sense, one can argue that it's easier to make theory and data agree in those uh, examples where so we are really dealing with physical objects. We are pulling on proteins or we are pulling on membranes, right? And so, what I was more interested in is trying to hear uh, thoughts on these matters from people who work on uh, in domains where we are standing sort of farther away from physical objects. And we're talking about whole cells or populations of neurons or behavior or evolutionary systems and so on. And so with that, uh, I'm going to um, start the actual workshop and give the screen to uh, Nat Bingreen. And we already are running a few minutes behind schedule because of the technical difficulties in the very beginning. So Nat, uh, the screen is yours. Please share it. Please go with that. Great. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, first off, I wanted to thank the organizers for putting together this symposium and this whole series of great symposia. Um, my title today, Tis the Gift to be Simple, is from a Shaker song. Um, but after hearing what Ilya wants from this workshop and from these talks, uh, I think a different title would be appropriate from the Rolling Stones, which is You Can't Always Get What You Want. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, whether it's what Ilya wants or not. Um, and that's to look back over uh, the times in you know, my own work and the work from my group where we felt brave enough to actually compare uh, what we're doing theoretically to real numbers in biology. And I have to say, I generally tell my students and postdocs not to do this because you know, biology is very complicated and the actual numbers are rarely what we care about because they're very strain specific, condition specific and so on. Um, but there have been some times when uh, we've gone out there and tried to compare real numbers from theory to real numbers in biology. And in thinking about that, um, I've recognized that those cases really fall under this class of there some, being some kind of underlying simplicity. And so today I want to give uh, a few examples uh, from that um, work we did on bacterial chemotaxis and quorum sensing uh, signaling systems in bacteria, uh, then talk a little bit about a more complex system of eukaryotic chemotaxis, and then something very complicated, which is some immunology problem and hope that by thinking about these very different cases, we'll be able to draw some general lessons. So uh, let's begin. 
And I want to start with bacterial chemotaxis, something that I look to for inspiration for all things, including in my personal life. So um, the idea here is that one starts with a system. This is a E. coli chemotaxis network. Of course, E. coli is a bacterium. It swims around and swims up gradients of things that it likes to eat uh, in order to find more food. And the system that does that is quite wonderful. Uh, it involves receptors, uh, kinases that phosphorylate a protein, that then diffuses and interacts with the motors, makes them turn in one direction, which makes the cells swim straight, or in another direction, which makes it tumble. Uh, the system adapts to different conditions based on methylation and, and demethylation. And you look at it and say, well, you know, this, this is maybe not as complicated as many other systems, but it's pretty complicated already to begin with. Um, what can one do? And so um, our experimental colleagues, of course, can measure things. They don't worry about how complicated things are. And so this is from a classic paper by Victor Sergic and Howard Berg, where they were able to measure the activity of this receptor system in response to a particular attractant that the E. coli likes uh, and show how the activity varies uh, as a function of that attractant level, but also depending on things like the previous history of the, of the bacterium, the methylation level of these receptors and so on. And you get various curves for what happens when you add the attractant and when you remove it. And you, know, you get a lot of data. And so what, what, you know, what can we hope as theorists to do other than writing down very, very, very complicated equations where we don't know it, many of the parameters at all and do a lot of fitting. Well, it turns out that we got, we're lucky here, and this is what I mean by it's the gift to be simple, that there is some underlying simplicity in this system. And that is that this whole system of receptors is basically a two-level system. It, as groups of receptors are either on or they're off, and they switch back and forth rapidly. And so one is really looking at the average time these receptors are on. In, and that's an equilibrium process. It's just determined by some free energy difference between the on state and the off state. Now, there are a bunch of different things that go into that free energy difference. Um, there's the number of receptors in a team, uh, the intrinsic energy difference between on and off, which is modified by this methylation and demethylation. There's the ligand that's being uh, applied to this system and the binding affinities and so on. But in the end, all of these different uh, factors really just go into one free energy difference, which is telling you, you know, what fraction of the time that these receptors are on. And that's what the experimentalists are measuring. And as a result, once we understand that, we can actually just replot the data as a function of this free energy difference. And you can see then that all of this data collapses because even though there are various complicated things going on, they all go into this one lumped variable. Um, and by doing that, we actually can realize some uh, insights into the real biological parameters. We can, for example, figure out things like the binding affinity of that ligand to the different receptors. Uh, and these turn out then to, to be borne out in experiment. So you know, the, the, the lesson from this slide is that maybe by virtue of, of uh, some underlying um, physical simplicity, uh, the complicated data can be reduced to something uh, more, more tractable and we can actually learn something quantitative from that. And I should say, you know, right up front that I think evolution has a lot to do with this because this system did have to evolve from something simpler. Presumably at one stage, there was a simple receptor uh, that was sensing something in the environment and that receptor was just a protein that had two conformations. And this one became the on state and this one became the off state. And that was then used by evolution as a signaling system. So the fact that there was an underlying two component system is something, some gift to us from evolution. Now, um, here the experimentalists were able to measure the output relatively close to the input. They were just measuring the level of phosphorylation of a particular protein that was more or less in contact with these receptors. But this kind of approach really didn't depend on that um, output being so direct. So I'll give you another example um, from our work uh, on quorum sensing with Bonnie Bassler and her group. 
And here's again a rather complicated signaling system where there are a lot of different uh, signals, ligands in this case made by the cell. This is Vibrio harvii. There are multiple different receptors that sense these. Uh, the information is again passed down, but in this case, it's not being measured directly. It's being measured at the end of some rather long pathway. And I have to say for your protection, I have not shown you all of the feedback loops in this network. Um, and again, the experimentalists are brave and they go out and they, they measure things. Um, it's looking at the output of light from the system as a function of one of these input ligands. And we really are not brave enough to try to model all of the steps here. But the point is that there's a single output as a function of a single input. And if that turns out that there really is again a lumped input, we don't actually need to know the details of this pathway as long as there's a one-to-one -one relationship we can still collapse the data. And the idea is that very much like the chemotaxis system, underlying this are receptors that are just two level systems. And so if we can represent the data in terms of a free energy difference between an on and an off state, again, we can hope for a data collapse. And, and that's what we see here. Um, so really the lesson here is the same as in the first slide that you would know, evolution has gifted us with a system that has some intrinsic simplicity because it's based on a two level system. Uh, but we can get away with measuring things after a complicated pathway, as long as there's simply a one-to-one -one relationship between the outputs that we see, light, and the inputs, which are, in this case, all of the things that directly affect the relative free energy of the two states of that receptor. Now, unfortunately, you know, nature is not always that kind. Um, there are lots of systems that are much more complicated than two-level systems. Uh, including in the case of chemotaxis. So if one looks at chemotaxis in eukaryotes and in particular in dictostelium, there's nothing so simple underlying how these cells change their direction. I should have said that we get parameters out of that too. So here is some tracks from uh, Monica Skoge and her coworkers showing uh, the history of a dictostelium cell, which is an amoeba crawling around. Uh, and in this case, it's also doing chemotaxis. It's moving up a gradient. But by gosh, this is pretty complicated. There's tons of different receptors. They feed in in complicated ways. There's direct spatial sensing and temporal sensing going on. And so, you know, you might say, well, maybe we should just give up. But uh, but we can again ask a, a different from a different perspective, ask for some simplicity. That maybe even though the system is complicated, it's working close to a biophysical limit. And so. Uh, in some work that we did with Robert Enders, we argued that, well, independent of how the dicti is sensing, maybe it's getting close to the biophysical limit that's set by the arrival of, of molecules at its surface. So just like the classic work of Howard and Berg, looking at the limits of detecting of concentrations, we could ask, what's the limit of detecting a gradient in concentration by comparing how many molecules hit you on your right side, say, for example, compared to your left side. And with this perspective, we were able to look at some you know, lovely data from Van Hostert and Postma, looking at how efficiently um, dictostelium could move up gradients uh, in terms of you know, some biologically relevant uh, 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 variables, that in this case, the distance from the pipette that they were applying uh, but when we recognize that, in fact, if you're near a biophysical limit, um, really all that you should be able to um, sense is determined by the gradient squared compared to the concentration. This turns out to be essentially the signal to noise ratio. And in, in that case, if you plotted the data as a function of signal to noise ratio, again, you could see some data collapse. And now it's not because of some underlying simplicity of the network or of the organism, it's an underlying simplicity that's reached because the organism is just very, very good at its job. It's reaching the biophysical limit of how well it could actually sense the gradient. So with, with those examples in mind, you could say, well, it's, that's still pretty simple. It's sensing something, you know, you, you know the problem at least. It's sensing a ligand concentration or it's sensing a gradient. Uh, can we ever hope for some kind of underlying simplicity when the task at hand is not so simple. And uh, here I'm gonna draw on a recent example from work that my group has done on immunology. And this was a, a problem that was called to our attention 
um, by Alan Perelson, who pointed out that in this rather ridiculously complicated system of the, a mouse immune system, sometimes the data looks simple. And so just very quickly, the idea is to take mice um, and look at how T cells are amplified when they see the antigen, when the T cell sees the presented antigen, that is, it is its life's work to find and bind to and then amplify that lineage of T cells. Um, and what was found was that as a function of the initial number of T cells that were uh, in, injected into this mouse, along with the, an antigen that was known to excite them, the degree of expansion of those T cells uh, exhibited a power law. So over many decades of this initial number, the fold expansion uh, behaved in a simple power law way. And so the when you, the idea is being that even though I really don't ever want to think about what's really going on in detail in a mouse, uh, when you see a power law or some kind of simple function like that, it's a hint that there's a single underlying process, that whatever's happening uh, with this small number of cells is also happening with this large number of cells. And the hope then is that there is some kind of underlying simplicity. And so this observation of a power law led us to think about what kind of underlying simplicity could be there. And we came to the conclusion that we could understand this in terms of a competition for antigen, that there are many T cells, uh, antigen is being presented in some finite amount by these antigen presenting cells. And the T cells are basically fighting for each other to see if they can, they can bind to this antigen and then be stimulated. Uh, and, and this simple picture you know, gave us some simple model, in which case we were able to see that, ah, there's a general way of getting power laws out of this. If I have something that is rising exponentially, the number of PT cells of each kind that's reproducing and growing exponentially, meeting a decaying exponential, which is the number of antigens since these antigens decay. And I should point out then that this line here is not just a fit to the, the data, it's actually the, the result of the model that we then wrote down. So I've come to the end of my time and I just wanna try to draw some general lessons if that's possible. Um, and the first one I guess is, well, how to recognize simplicity. You have some experimental system. Um, and, and from our point of view, one of the great things has been data collapse. That is, if you have lots of data under different conditions and you can collapse it as a function of a single variable, there is real hope then that there's something underlying simplicity either intrinsically in the network, like a two level system for a receptor or because of some approach to a biophysical limit. And second, if there's some kind of simple functional dependence, maybe a power law or an exponential or something over many decades, that hints again at an underlying simplicity. And we can ask, you know, again, when do you get that? Maybe gift of evolution, because things started out simple, maybe they're still simple when they're approaching a biophysical limit. And of course, things that I haven't touched on, and I hope maybe some of my colleagues will, for example, when one approaches a continuum limit, as in continuum mechanics, or interestingly near a critical point. So in closing, I want to thank some of the people who have been influential to me in this work and whose work I mentioned, and, and our funding sources. And I think now is my opportunity to answer some questions. Thank you, Ned. Um... I would like first to ask if uh, anybody on among the speakers on the panel has any questions. Just go ahead and mute yourself and ask some if you if you have any. Uh, hey Ned, Yana here. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. That was really fun. Uh, one thing I've, I've been wondering a lot is you know this kind of idea of emergent simplicity. Do you have any comments on the fact that, you know, if you look at these sort of kind of simple models that, you, um, that you've played around with and you kind of go down to the level of genes, you'll often find that there are many, many genes that maybe control one or two of these coarse grained variables. Uh, I don't know if that's even an idea, uh, but I, uh, I just find that in some of the examples I've played around with kind of exciting and interesting and I have no idea if it means anything cosmic, but I just thought maybe I could throw that at you and that you can comment. <laughs> okay, I need more clarification. So you have many genes, many proteins that are controlling some... Well, let's say uh, like a rate or a, or a material parameter, like I don't know if you're descri describing something with continuum mechanics, like an elastic constant or a viscosity, right? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to say that I have a very clear idea of why this is, but you know, one thing again is that everything makes sense in light of evolution, or only in light of evolution. That you know, the system somehow started out at some simple level, and it's possible that you know the way evolution has worked is simply to be adding modifications to that without fundamentally changing it. And I, I've certainly seen examples of this. Um, I think the quorum sensing network is is one where you know, there's all sorts of feedbacks and complicated things. But if we think hard about it, we can make the case that it started out simple, quorum sensing, sensing the concentration of some chemical that the cells make, but that additional functionality was added onto that. And in this particular case, the, it looks like the functionality was that the cells had to respond very, very quickly to a change from a high density of, of signal to a low density, as if they fell out of a biofilm into the ocean. And, and then all of these extra genes that were involved seem to be adding on some extra function to an underlying network without deciding to redo the whole thing because, that, because of the need for that extra function. So there may be just this sort of accretion of uh, additional function or you know, additional fine tuning that leads to that kind of structure. Um, so I see there's a couple of questions related to questions on uh, on the on YouTube. So three three D this was and John Lastol is asking basically, but I'm paraphrasing a bit, um, sort of uh, trying to do this collapse and it is effectively try, is it effectively trying to find low dimensional representations of the data, right? So is it possible to is there a, a, a principled way for trying to find out? what are the low dimensional simple structures inside the data without physics intuition, without knowing how to collapse the data or without knowing where to look? Well, okay, the answer is of course, there's whole fields that are dealing with trying to find low dimensional representations. And I, I am not one to speak to They're that, but you know. Low dimensional representations of data. They're not talking about low dimensional models, right? Generally. Yeah, you know, I have to say, you know, despite all of the wonderful sophistication, I've done really well with principal component analysis over the years. <laughs> so I would, I would try that first and see see how well that works. And then, you know, think, think more after that. Okay, good. So uh, I would like to uh, thank Ned. Uh, and there is a few more questions online, Ned, from a couple of different people. So if you can log in into YouTube and just answer them in the, um, in the chat. And we're gonna switch to the next speaker, Yannick Wonde from Brandai. Thank you, Ned. Thank you. Yeah, and you can share your screen. Mm -hmm. All right, hopefully that's that all looks good. Um, so, <clears throat> so I, I'm going to talk about again cell biology, which was um, what we just heard about Ned, and I, I think I'll I'll end up sort of uh, touching on some very uh, very similar themes that uh, that Ned touched upon. So, uh, so I hope that's not going to be too redundant. So, um, let's see. So, I think the first thing I, I wanted to do was uh, give you all a sense of. Uh, uh, how we sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, up, approach these problems. Uh, so we're generally interested in what cells do, and in particular, what happens inside cells. And <clears throat> one of the sort of points of view that we like to take is to think of cells as engineers. And we, we're very keen on understanding what are the sort of engineering problems that, uh, that, that cells are solving. And then we try to get into uh, the question of how do they solve these problems, but the but the most interesting, I think, aspect of the whole thing is the question. So, <clears throat> so here, just as an example, I've, I, I've sh I'm showing a, a video. This is from Sunny Ji's lab, some old experiments. <clears throat> excuse me, on the expression of uh, I think this is uh, uh, lac lactose permease. It doesn't matter. That's the yellow thing that's that's lighting up. And what you can kind of see here is E. coli cells in bright field. And then there's this yellow, which is the fluorescence coming off of the proteins. And this is a mo movie that's looping around. So the cells themselves are a couple of microns in length. And uh, the generation time is on the order of 30 to 50 minutes, depending on growth conditions. 
And as this movie loops around, but you know, you, there's a bunch of really interesting questions that come up that you can ask, right? Um, uh, for example, uh, you know, the cell is growing. Uh, how does it know when to divide? Now, if a cell is growing and in E. coli, for example, this growth is exponential in time, the mass increases exponentially with time over a generation, um, you know, how, are this, how is this growth and division coordinated to achieve a stable size? Because if you were to kind of now look at this uh, growth and division over many generations, you would find sort of that there is a distribution of cell sizes, but it's not, not, not extremely wide, it's, it's quite narrow. So how does that achieve? Uh, one of my favorite questions, which of course, uh, I, I think I originally learned from Ned at some point is how does a cell find its middle? This is one of my, that's one of the favorite questions I like to ask my undergraduates because it's, uh, it seems like such a silly question to ask, but if you're an E. coli, that's a really uh, challenging problem, finding its middle, because of course it has to put to the cytokinetic ring right in the middle when it's dividing. So it gets uh, roughly <clears throat> equal mass between the two daughter cells. And, uh, you know, and then obviously uh, the, this experiment is about gene expression. And what you can see here is that the cells are making some kind of a decision, so to speak, when they're expressing this yellow fluorescent protein. So how does the cell decide whether to express this uh, gene or not? Because uh, what you can see in this movie is that the two daughter cells, one, on the, one towards the top left and one kind of down towards the middle, uh, those two daughter cells are doing something very different. They both start out with a little bit of the protein and then this one in the middle ends up with a lot of protein. So these are all kind of interesting, in my opinion, questions that, that are really engineering challenges uh, to the cell. And, uh, and so I thought at first of what I do is I try to give you a sense of what we mean by success. And I think Ned's already talked about it in his talk. Uh, maybe he hasn't sort of highlighted as much and, you know, by showing those data collapses. And that I think is real, in my opinion, also great success of the theory to be able to do that. So in general, when we are confronted with these questions, like what do we think about, uh, when, what, what do we want to achieve, you know? So, uh, so you know, in our thinking, we're mostly kind of usually starting off with some cartoon and these cartoons are typically things that have been put together by, you know, molecular biologists, cell biologists who worked, you know, sometimes decades to kind of get all the details of how a particular mechanism works. And, you know, just to illustrate this, I took a Rube Goldberg cartoon that, that shows a device <clears throat> where, you know, this guy here has to sit on a whoopee cushion and uh, the, the point of the device is eventually that there's a camera that snaps. And, Probably the best part of the device is this little cigar here that gets pushed over to the balloon and it pops. And then this guy is a dictator thinking that uh, he's being uh, shot at. So he falls back and sits off the trigger uh, to start the camera. So, you know, so, so that might be like a cartoon that, that describes this device that you might be interested in something or start measuring something that's quite quantitative, for instance, like the time lag between uh, this person sitting down on the whoopee cushion and the camera going off. So how would, you know, how do would you approach that? Well, you know, maybe you'll write down some governing equation like Newton's laws. You decide maybe the time it takes for this uh, sail uh, moving along this ice block uh, as being the kind of relevant time scale in the problem. And, you know, you write down Newton's equations. And then the first thing you want to ask is like, does this governing equation actually account for the measurements of the lag? You know, if you're lucky enough it does, then of course, the next thing you wanna do is try to make testable predictions, things that you can actually do in the lab, like you know, how does the lag, for example, in this situation depend on the sales size, the, the length of the ice track, et cetera. So to the extent that we can do all this, we, we, we declare success in, in the kinds of problems that, uh, that we, we study. So, uh, so to get away from Rube Goldberg's cartoons, I thought I'd uh, actually describe <clears throat> just one one uh, vignette of something that uh, uh, that uh, came out recently uh, out of our out of my lab, and and uh, <clears throat> it's not because I've, I'm particularly uh, a huge fan of uh, DNA damage repair, even though it's a fascinating process. In the context of, of this symposium, I just really wanted to use it as an example. So <clears throat> what we've been looking at is, uh, the, as I said, the process by which cells and our experiments in yeast, its yeast cells uh, repair DNA damage. So there's a break in the double-stranded DNA at some point inside the nucleus on the DNA. And once this break happens, and you can see on the right here, there's a whole sort of slew of things that, that happen which involves recruiting a bunch of binding proteins to the break site, which in turn recruit kinases, 
And then these kinases, what they, they do, and this is the problem we're interested in, is they somehow lead to the spreading of histone modifications, which are here indicated in this cartoon in yellow, spreading of histone modifications away from this break site. And we'd like to understand how is this achieved? How is this spread? Uh, what is the mechanism by which this spread occurs? And this spread occurs over very large distances on the order of 100 kilobases away from the break site over time scales, which are on the order of an hour or so, just to give you a sense. So uh, again, uh, the way we you know, started thinking about this problem, we actually looked at the literature and the, I, this question of modif modifications of histones and how they spread has been studied quite a bit. And you'll find in that literature, a number of different cartoons that people have come, have come up with. So for example, this looping one suggests that maybe the kinase stays put at the break site and then because the chromatin itself is a flexible polymer, eventually it will loop back on this kinase uh, and there will be a uh, contact between the kinase and some distant uh, piece of the DNA. And that will lead, or as you say, the chromatin and that contact between the kinase and actually the histones and the chromatin will lead to uh, phosphorylation. And there are other ideas like directed sliding, diffusion of kinases in the nucleoplasm, diffusion of kinases along the, uh, along the DNA chain. And we'd like to know, what if, which if any of these mechanisms are actually responsible for the spreading process. So what do we do? Well, we, act, we, we take these cartoons seriously and we turn them into uh, physics models or mathematical models, if you will. You throw in some rates for the various processes. So if it's a sliding model, you have some rate at which the kinase arrives, at which it leaves the binding, at which it leaves the break site. And then it has some hopping rate and maybe a falling off rate. And, you know, then we know how to do math. So we calculate uh, the one quantity that we can measure in experiments, which is the probability that at some distance, and here's the data that we've taken eventually, uh, at, what's the probability that at some distance here measured in kilobases, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 kilobases, what's the probability that that histone is uh, phosphorylated? And of course that probability, as you can see here, as you go from bottom to top grows with time. So we have the spatiotemporal spreading of these, of these uh, of, this, uh, of these histone modifications. And we're asking to what extent uh, can we describe those in, with any of these models that, uh, that we've uh, put forth. And so, you know, in this particular case, what we decided to do is actually compete these four models against each other, uh, do, you know, some uh, kind of a Bayesian approach. It doesn't really matter. And the bottom line is at the end of the day, we found that this directed sliding model where the kinase starts from the double-stranded break and moves along the DNA uh, is the one that does best uh, with the data. So, so, so then, and I'm not gonna describe that, of course, with, with this sort of model in hand and the parameters that we extract in hand, we can make predictions and do further experiments with mutants, which we did and, and uh, tested some of the uh, other predictions of this model. But what I wanted to, uh, uh, really point out here is that we take numbers very seriously and then Ned commented on that and one of the numbers that came out of this was the rate at which the kinase moves along the DNA phosphorylating the, the histones. I happened to give this talk in MVL uh, a year ago or so and uh, my buddy Leonid Mirny was in the audience and some of you might know that Leonid is completely obsessed about uh, loop extrusion and extrusion of chromatin through cohesin rings and he came up to me after the talk and said, you know, it's really funny that rate of, of sliding of your kinase is roughly the same as the rate at which uh, cohesins extrude DNA uh, through, these, uh, through, the, through this uh, uh, ring that they make. And uh, could it be that your mechanism isn't that something is moving along the DNA, but that the kinase is standing still and that the, actually the DNA is moving against the kinase. So he reminded us actually of, you know, Galileo's principle that what we're really measuring is relative motion of the kinase and the DNA, we don't know uh, from our experiments or theory which one's actually moving. So, uh, so that was very exciting. We started doing experiments to test this idea. And in the meantime, which is maybe more exciting, a paper came out of a lab in France where they actually proposed uh, cohesin rings and loop extrusion as the mechanism of histone modification, modification spreading in mammalian cells, specifically for the enzyme, which is the, which is the which is the analog of the enzyme we studied in yeast. So uh, of course we continue to do these experiments. So the reason I put out this example is simply to say, by taking the numbers seriously, we ended up sort of coming up with a completely uh, new idea, or I should say Leonid suggested a completely new idea for us, which was not at all on our radar, 
about how this uh, process works inside inside yourself. So uh, I'll just end with that. Uh, I'm a big fan of this essay by Joel Cohen. And uh, I, uh, part of what I try to convey was the message of this essay, where he talks about how mathematics is biology's next microscope, only better. And in this little example, it's only to the extent that by studying this process, taking the math seriously, we were able to come up with a new uh, sort of mechanism, which we couldn't see uh, so to speak, through uh, the chip experiments that we were doing. So I'll just end with that. And uh, I have to say that uh, this is all made possible uh, doing these kinds of experiments uh, combined with theory by Jim Haber, a colleague of mine at Brandeis, who's very uh, kind and takes into his lab uh, physics students like Kevin Lee, uh, who just graduated and did all the experiments and Gabe Bronk did uh, pretty much all the all the theory. So thanks for your attention and I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Janet. Uh, thank you for a great talk. So uh, first, as always, we're turning to the panel. Uh, does anybody want to start us off with, with a question? Well, while people are getting gathering their thoughts, I'll ask something, right? You, you sort of went very quickly over um, uh, Bayesian statistics and all that. And, and so one thought which I have been having for a while uh, and which some people actually asked during the uh, registration for this workshop, uh, what it is that we need to teach our physicists so that they can actually apply theory to biology. And so one thought maybe is that we don't teach enough statistics so that we cannot distinguish these models which are different only by um, you know, second significant digit somewhere uh, without actually doing proper statistics. And what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, over the last five years, I mean, I should say also, in, you know, in all honesty, one of the main reasons I, I started working on this was to teach myself Bayesian statistics, because very early on, I, I realized there was no hope without doing some uh, serious statistics. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, our, my standard physics education of doing inclined planes and uh, you know, getting error bars and doing least squares uh, is uh, completely inadequate and actually quite uh, silly in retrospect uh, because uh, I never really was bold enough to ask my teachers why least squares and why, why should I be doing this and not something else. And, uh, and so, uh, so I think one of the, yeah, one, I would say if, if I were, you know, if, I were, if I'm thinking about sort of how we change the way we teach uh, proper, teaching proper statistics, uh, whether Bayesian or frequentist doesn't, you know, but teaching really proper statistics, statistics and having a serious statistics uh, sort of course as part of the physics curriculum, I think is really uh, important and not, not just for biology, but for everything we do. Um, yeah, so. Uh, I mean, you know, I just, I don't know, you know, I just, as, you, as you know, I was in condensed matter physics, you know, go to all these talks and people would show you data and then there'd be some line and it would kind of go through data, miss some points and, and then be like, look, you know, it's, it, it looks great. And, you know, depending on the stature of the person, statute of the person, you'd say, oh, wow, yes, perfect, great. Or you'd say, I don't know, there's those points that are missing. So then you start arguing, it just all seems in retrospect, rather silly. Right. Um, well, the, does the panel have any more questions? Yeah, no. Then we're going to move to the online questions. And so uh, the first one is from John Vastola. Did you expect a priori that the data would be clean enough and model would fit well enough to derive a reasonable number for the sliding? Uh, no. <laughs> Why do you think it happened? Uh, yeah, so if I were a, a better mathematician, maybe, or physicist or something, I, I would have thought about this, uh, uh, this ahead of time. Um, well, well, first of all, you know, the number, yeah, the no, you know, so I, I forget, but you know, our 95% confidence integral on this number is probably on the order of 100%. So all I can tell you really is that, you know, I didn't get into this, that it's, that it's a few to a 10 kilobases per minute. And so I don't think the number is all that well defined, but uh, but uh, I you know um, but uh, I had no pre you know I had no preconceived idea as to whether we'd be able to get anything out of this. I honestly went into this project 
because I wanted to learn uh, Bayesian statistics. That might sound kind of silly, but uh, but that was my motivation to begin with. Uh, and I thought the experiments were very clean and interesting. So, so another question from uh, Madeleine Bonsma Fisher. In the loop extrusion, extrusion mechanism, do you see histone modifications only on one side of the break, or does the loop move through on both sides? Yeah, there, that's a really good question. Uh, so, uh, um, so going back to the experiments, right? We, we these are not uh, single cell experiments. So we look at sort of the the, the spreading of these modifications in a populations of a population of cells. So we don't know whether for any given cell the 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 propagation, you know, whether it goes uh, uh, only in one direction and things like that. Uh, so I guess uh, I guess we don't have. Uh, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. Okay. And another question is from Aditya, Aditya Chincholi. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the names. Uh, you started out with a number of different hypotheses and reduced it down to one. Yeah. As for scale up in complexity, the number of superficially compatible ideas will increase um, fast as well. So how do we tackle that one, the number of possible hypotheses? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I find that to be a really interesting uh, problem. And like Ned, I have to sort of, uh, even though I'm trying to get on top of that literature and understand it better, I have to sort of say I'm, I'm at this point quite ignorant about some of these uh, sort of uh, more detailed questions with regards to, uh, uh, you know, sort of model selection and so forth. Uh, another way you can ask the question, well, you know, I can also think of, uh, you know, you know, I can come up with probably 10, 15 other models of, of this thing and, and keep doing this. And, I'll pro and I'm sure I'll find some that does better on the data. You know, now, whether that will just be a small perturbation on the one we chose or not, I have no a priori way of knowing. So, uh, so that's that. So then uh, the way I like to ask the question and ask my friends who do these kinds of things more seriously is, you know, how much do you really trust your conclusions? Like how much would you, money would you bet that your final conclusion is actually correct? Because, you know, like when these methods were invented, you know, the classic thing was Laplace uh, figuring out the, ma the mass of Saturn. And he formulated his result as a bet. He formulated his result as a bet that in 100 years, the, the mass would not be known to, I forget now, better than what he had uh, to one part in 10,000. And if he made the bet, he would have won because current NASA numbers are still within his range. But of course, what Laplace had, and we don't, we don't have, is universal law of gravitation. He knew that the, that the equations he was using, the dynamical equations, had to be correct. And we have no way of knowing that in terms of like looking at some specific sort of thing inside the cell. So, uh, so I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, the way also I like to think about it is, uh, given this quantitative data, how do we successfully or with you know successfully meaning I, I can bet some good fraction of my monthly salary on the on the final result how do we successfully figure out what's the qualitative uh feature that we're interested in like what i was really interested in is whether these phosphorylation spread by things moving along the dna or by moving three-dimensionally through the nucleoplasm that's kind of what i'd really like to know for other reasons and i'd like you know, and I'd like to figure that out independent of models, and but through this quantitative data, and I, and I find that kind of to be an interesting inference problem, which I, I've looked around it. I don't know that there is actually, maybe there is, but I, I haven't found literature on that. Yeah. So there are other questions uh, online uh, for you in the YouTube, um, like for example, there is a discussion about whether statistical significance is the same or different or how is it different from biological significance. But at that point, this point, we should probably end and move to the next uh, talk. Uh, thank you again. And uh, Arvind, could you please uh, share your screen? Am I good to go? Yes, you're good to go. Um, well, um, thank you, uh, Ilya, for organizing this. Um, so I was gonna talk about um, today's question, um, but in a specific context. Um, the context being, to what extent does the physics of a protein, meaning what it does when you poke at it, to what extent does that determine its evolutionary dynamics, meaning what happens when you mutate it? Um, a first draft of these ideas with some confrontation to data is gonna show up in a journal just about now, but we are right now thinking about how to take this forward with experiments, um, how to test this. And we have a range of choices that really gets at um, the big question of today. So I wanted to present this in this context. So to be specific, this is about epistasis, 
which simply means the non-additive effect of multiple mutations. So you take a protein, you're interested in some function, catalytic efficiency, you make two single mutants, you make the double mutant, ask how non-additive was the effect. You could do that pairwise, let's say for 10 different sites and you make a matrix. Um, at this point, though, it's important to think about why people care about this uh, epistasis because it sort of informs what kind of experiment you want to do to test theories. Um, at one end, you could imagine many people want to understand a single protein, understand which residues interact, or maybe they want to engineer a protein. And if you have strong epistasis, that maybe makes it difficult or informs interactions. At sort of at the far other end, you could imagine that strong epistasis says that the sequence to function map is complicated, which might affect the evolution of this protein, it might make it more contingent and difficult to evolve, right? So sort of two broad reasons, and I want you to keep that in mind. So um, broadly speaking, the impulse when you measure epistasis, let's say um, these entries in this matrix and you measure strong values, the impulse is to conclude, oh, um, things are pretty rugged. It's like a spin glass. The sequence to function map is terrible. Engineering is difficult, evolution is difficult, but that's not actually true. It's possible that the strong entries in this matrix have some secret relationships with each other, um, which actually turns that whole sequence to function map into something smooth. It's just a global nonlinearity applied to some linear underlying trait. Just to give an example, you measure this matrix secretly if it was rank one, you could just complete the squares and you actually get a smooth sequence to function map. There was no complication. Um, and actually many people have thought about this, including um, Ant Flo, Bitball, and Ned, and uh, Jacob Atmanowski, who um, starting with his time at Emory has shown with Ilya, has shown that many real data sets are of this um, simple right-hand side kind. Right? Um, and so the um, broad question we've been interested in is, what is the mech is there a broad mechanistic origin for the left versus the right? But is there some way from the underlying physics you can predict whether it's left or right? The naive guess is that if you have strong interactions, the residues of a protein are strongly interacting, you should get a rugged landscape. If they're not interacting, you should get the other side. And essentially the observation we had, um, which we are not trying to test, is that in fact, there's another generic reason, a generic way in which strongly interacting residues can actually give you a very simple epistasis. Essentially, the strong interactions conspire to give you a mode gap in the physical dynamics. Right? So that's just our um, theoretical idea. I'm gonna show you some evidence, but the real question is, um, there are many ways to test this in an experiment, and I feel like they get at different questions. So just for the next two slides, I'm gonna give you some very brief intuition on why this, why, what the theory is. Um, if I do a bad job, you should look at our paper. So imagine you take a protein without any soft modes and you make three mutations. It's going to deform in completely idiosyncratic ways. Instead, if there was a big mode gap and one physical soft mode, the mutations, if they have some overlap with, the, with that soft mode, should generally give you stereotype deformations along sort of the same low dimensional space. Another way of saying it is imagine you make two epistatic cycle mutations. So A, B, A plus B, C, D, C plus D. And you plot the structures in some high dimensional structure space. On the left, those six or seven structures will be all over the place in high dimensions. On the right, you'd expect them to be confined to a low dimensional space defined by those soft modes. That structure, what you really care about is some function. And here, oh, something wrong went wrong with animations, but Think about any function you want, let's say some catalytic efficiency, and you plot contours of that function in this high dimensional structure space. What you can see if you stare at this for a bit is on the left-hand side, epistasis for A, B, and C, D are logically independent. They're coming from completely different parts of this function space or structure space. On the right-hand side, epistasis A, B, and C, D can still be strong, can still be unequal, but they're sort of emerging from one underlying reason namely how the fitness function behaves along the soft mode because of one global nonlinearity. And hence you can show actually things are much simpler than you expected. Right? You can actually do the math of this instead of a graphical analysis. Essentially the prediction is if you have one soft mode, the epistasis matrix should be rank one. If you have two soft modes, it should be a rank two and so on. Right? Which are ideas that people have thought about um, in spin glasses. So that's the theory. So to zoom out though, 
how do you take this forward to experiment? And I think here, I like this example because it really shows you can decide what you think the theory is telling you. At the most granular level, it's telling you simply that two residues, the epistasis between two residues depends on how those residues participate in different soft modes of a protein. If you wanted to test that, you could take a particular enzyme, DHFR, pick two enzymes, do an MD simulation of how those residues participate in the soft modes, predict epistasis, go measure it. And in fact, that's been done by Charlie Baker's lab along the lines I outlined, and it does seem to work for those two residues. In the near future, the lab next door, Rama Ranganathan's lab, can replace the MD simulation aspect of it, part of it, with a direct measurement of the soft modes of a protein by hitting it with an electric field at a specific site, deforming the protein, and then taking quick photos of it, x-ray photos of it, as it relaxes back. Right? And again, you can make the comparison. So this is what I think Ilya would call a very quantitative comparison. It's a useful one for engineers and people who want to understand a single protein. But I would also say it's maybe the least surprising one. To me, what it really says is if you put enough resources in, you can understand the biophysics of one protein, enough computational experimental resources. Instead, you could choose to test this at sort of a broader, uh, broader implications of what I said. So for example, in our paper, you'll find links to these analyses. You could look at the evolutionary variation and structure of a single protein across many extant species, that is across a protein family. Right? You do PCA on those structures and you find that it's actually low dimensional. Structures change in only a few ways across many, many mutations in extant species. But then you take one of those proteins and do a soft matter analysis. You do normal mode analysis and you can show that the evolutionary directions of structure variation are mostly contained in the softest normal modes of one individual, any individual in that family, right? And it's not a muon G minus two prediction and confirmation like Ilya mentioned in the poster, but I think it's pretty good given that you're comparing a soft matter calculation to variation in proteins between humans and snakes. And there are many other examples that uh, we've linked to in our paper. Then you can zoom out even more. And uh, to me, the most interesting implication of this work is that proteins can have concrete mechanical features whose purpose isn't any direct function, but gets at this nebulous fluffy idea of evolvability. Because usually when you hear soft mode in a protein, people think allosteric, which is a directly functional soft mode. Actually in the analysis I went through, the soft mode need not be functional in any way. It need not, you don't need it. Maybe you don't need it for the catalytic efficiency. Just the presence of the soft mode, even if you don't use it for anything, makes the evolution of other unrelated functions easier. So to us that suggested a directed evolution experiment where for example, where we select for features that have no fitness benefit for an individual, but give you the lineage of benefit like through evolvability. So for example, we would take a protein, evolve it under constant selection for some function, in a different experiment, evolve it with alternating selection for two functions, F and G, finishing with F, and compare these two proteins, right? And despite being a theory group until last year, uh, we've put a lot of time, money, and effort this last year um, setting up this experiment. The postdoc, the theory postdoc, Kabir, is now doing this um, full time. Um, and I don't know what we'll see. We may see no difference, right? It's actually a platform of experiments, but we may see no difference. We may see a soft mode. We may see some other feature we can correlate with evolvability. But to me, it doesn't matter. Because for me, the takeaway is that at least in this context, the qualitative prediction is actually the most ambitious one and the least likely to be confirmed in an experiment. But it's still interesting because it suggested a very specific experiment whose results I think will be interesting no matter what, even when you throw away the theory. Right. So with that, I'll stop and um, Thank uh, you for listening um, and Kabir for doing the uh, work. Take any questions. Thank you, Ivan, and thank you for keeping on time. Uh, so, do we have any questions from the from the Zoom room? Yeah. So this is Eve Martyr, and I'm just curious whether you've actually looked at ion channel proteins because ion channels and their single channel um, dynamics give you a very very close quantitative readout of structure and function and what happens with mutations. And it seems like most of the other proteins you're looking at 
um, all the measurements are much less direct. And so to my mind, it, ion channel proteins would be the absolute best place to look at these theories. Um, thank you, that's a, a great point. So actually, um, these EFX experiments that I mentioned uh, where uh, this is in the lab next door, Ranganathan's lab, uh, where they hit the protein with the field and then watch the soft modes. Um, currently, that's exactly what they're doing, applying it to ion channels. So that's, you know, that's exactly where we'll be maybe in two, three years from now. Um, in, in the analysis I've shown- um, Why so are, they, are they doing the single channel recordings? Um, no, so this is just the biophysics of the channel. So, so this is the channel with ions being transported through it. But what they do is take, so they disturb the channel with an electric field. And as the channel relaxes back, they take many rapid, within 100 nanoseconds, they take many rapid X-ray snapshots. But I would want to know what the channel is actually doing, how it's uh, floating yeah. in. And without that, none of this would make any, in other words, as a biologist, right. Without the actual function, which is how the ions are fluxing through the channel, I would sorry. view that as sort of vaguely not relevant. Right. No, sorry. The crystal structures do show you at what stage of the ion transport they are in. But in that sense, yes, they do. They're, they're monitoring the function and the structure, and monitoring perturbations at the same time, the structural perturbations. The, the X-ray structure does show you whether there are two ions in it and at what stage they are at during this transport. I'm not sure I'm, yeah. Can I ask a, a mm -hmm. question? So thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, so I guess I'm interested in when you think you're going to get a, a soft mode with a gap, because like if I just give you an elastic network, I mean, there's something called the boson peak, which tells you the opposite, that you expect there to be, you know, a lot of soft modes close together. So is this chance evolution? You know, what, what do you think? Exactly. I mean, well, the ambitious uh, hypothesis would be that it's exactly that uh, the natural statistics randomness would take you away from it, that uh, it's only if evolvability is important enough that you would end up selecting for this. That the only thing the soft mode does here for you is make the sequence to function map of other functions smooth. And in some sense, the point of these experiments is to ask under what conditions would you select for such second order effects? because those are not immediately helpful to an individual, but it might help uh, the whole lineage or the whole clade. So it's, it's exactly the answer is, uh, if this exists, it would only be by selecting for something like evolvability. Right? Or unless the soft mode directly has a function, in which case, right? that maybe that's probably the zero total expectation. And to get back to, to, to Ned's original, uh, sort of his next talk, right? He was talking about, in some sense, emergent simplicity coming from uh, a function being you know, solving the function very accurately, right? And, you know, are we talking about something similar here is that uh, we get an emergent simplicity in the structure to function mapping because we're trying to satisfy a function that is reasonably difficult to satisfy and, and it really takes all the effort to do that? Yes, but it's, it's sort of, but and the, the end, function being availability, right? The function. Right, exactly. Yes, and I agree with you. That's right. That's right. That's right. That uh, yeah, and that way it sort of goes back to uh, Ned's first point there. That why is it simple? Well, maybe it's because it had to be evolved in the first place. Um, so that would be the right. That's sort of the same answer I'm giving Ned. That uh, the only reason to expect this is if evolvability were important enough. And I'm not saying it always is. The point of these experiments is to ask in what parameter regimes of population dynamics will that be important. Maybe sometimes you don't care. You just evolve and solve the problem. Okay, so we have a question from online. Um, so uh, Moshe Har Harsh uh, is asking if uh, the following, if you measure commutations with direct coupling analysis on the same protein in different organism, it gives very strong locations which tend to be correlated structurally and functionally. Isn't that a direct evidence against the soft modes? Uh, I'm not sure. I agree with the first part of the statement, but I guess I didn't see the implication. Uh, the, soft, so the soft mode, uh, just to emphasize, is a mechanical property of the protein. Um, so I'm not sure how the sequence analysis implies something about the mechanical aspect. Another question is from um, Eric van Nimwegen. Could you get selection for a soft mode as a consequence of selecting for something else, like foldability, stability under temperature changes, or something similar? Yeah, I haven't thought about it, right. Um, 
I mean, I would broadly agree just because uh, there's presumably other reasons. I mean, the most obvious one is that the soft mode itself has a function, but I presume Eric is pointing out other examples where the soft mode doesn't have a direct function, but helps, um, I'd be interested to know if there are such examples, but uh, I don't personally know of such hypotheses. So do we have any more questions from the panel? Uh, there is another question from uh, YouTube. Um, John Val, uh, Vastola, he likes the comment about the last prediction being the most interesting, but the hardest to confirm also, right? And he's asking if you have any thoughts on extracting modeled independent predictions more generally from quantitative models. Um, I guess not, because I'm saying the, uh, the, the predictions here, I would say are model independent on the right-hand side. Um, but it's also a qualitative prediction. It's just, it's not really a prediction. I'm just saying, well, it'll be interesting to do directed evolution and try and select for, you know, features related to evolvability. Um, so I guess I don't have an answer to what he's asking. I have the opposite, qualitative things that uh, are model independent. Well, okay, thank you, Arvind. I think we are going to break at this point. Um, thank you for the great talk and, you know, also log into YouTube and, ans and answer any question that are there. We'll be back at 11.15. Um, um, so we'll be back at 11.15 uh, and we'll try to start on time and catch up with the uh, time we lost in the first se se session due to technical issues. Thank you, everybody.
So Ilya. Or if you can share your screen now, we should start. Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's our second of three sessions, and we start uh, without further ado with Boris Schramman. Well, it's uh, it's great to be here while not being there, um, and uh, I'm uh, going to continue with the theme of uh, emergent simplicity, but um, we'll jump scales from uh, molecules in our previous talk to organisms and um, basically be talking about uh, morphogenesis um, and in particular um, the first two hours so trying to understand the first two hours of fly development right so normally uh, right I would give uh, a longish introduction into this there's no time so I'll just uh, play or try to play a little movie uh, which starts with sort of very first uh, events in the development of uh, fly embryo. And uh, these first events involve expression of genes in interesting spatial patterns. In particular here, you're beginning to see the expression of Eve stripes. Now that's some important um, developmental gene. But the next thing you're going to see is a massive rearrangement of cells. Um, this formation of uh, eventual furrow starts now. And it's followed by this major, major rearrangement uh, of uh, uh, tissue, which uh, in the embryo just is a uh, um, monolayer of epithelial cells lying on the surface. And uh, this particular movie is done by light sheet microscopy and uh, was done by uh, Sebastian Strakan. And uh, uh, Sebastian likes to unroll the skin of the embryo onto the plane and uh, then do a nice quantitative analysis. For example, measure velocities, which uh, you do by PIV. And uh, first the velocities are small, you now the, the flow is rather slow, but uh, then it speeds up and you see interesting patterns of flow. Um, for example, there are sort of hyperbolic uh, fixed points on uh, sort of the belly of uh, the embryo and uh, on the back. And of course, when there are two hyperbolic fixed points, there are also four elliptic fixed points. And uh, um, you can see velocity, you can also track cells uh, over uh, a long period of time, really mapping out uh, very quantitatively um, uh, this uh, cellular rearrangement on the surface. So, how do we begin to think about what uh, in this movie looks like uh, your regular hydrodynamic flow? Well, here it's uh, uh, not at all a regular hydrodynamic flow. It's not generated by external forces. It is generated by internal rearrangement of cells. So the challenge is to describe this internal rearrangement of, of cells, describe tissue mechanics and relate um, uh, this rearrangement of cells to uh, patterns and dynamics of uh, gene expression, which encodes the morphogenetic program. So uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, cell mechanics. Um, this, so epithelial cell mechanics uh, is dominated by uh, ectomyosin uh, cortices, which sort of line uh, the lateral sides of, of cells and are made of uh, bundles of uh, actin, sort of cross-linked by uh, uh, myosin motors, which also generate tension in, uh, in these filaments. And uh, the cortices of um, individual cells, right, these cortical belts are again uh, riveted together by adhesion molecules, coherents, which form uh, complexes. So that's... Uh, um, a very simple picture. Of course, the reality is vastly more complicated. These uh, uh, adherence junctions uh, involve uh, dozens of, if not hundreds of uh, proteins. And uh, uh, that's not even to mention uh, um, uh, regulatory circuits that uh, control the assembly of uh, cytoskeleton. So 
uh, where do we stop um, um, uh, this uh, model building? So how much of this complexity do we want to capture? And we of course uh, want to argue that uh, we want to capture as little of it or as much of it as is enough to explain um, mechanics. And what is important in mechanics is uh, force balance, is mechanical equilibrium. So immediately after introducing these molecular players, at least uh, um, a few of them, we want to forget about it and uh, just start thinking about geometry of cells and uh, if you like uh, elastic properties uh, of cells, so we'll think of cell interfaces as uh, uh, little uh, springs and uh, but if, and which uh, on the fast time scale have to reach mechanical equilibrium, right? This tissue stays together. But uh, tissue on the other hand is not just uh, an elastic uh, sort of medium uh, as described in Landau and Lifshitz. It is made of these active uh, filaments, which can contract, uh, again, under the action of uh, myosin, um, or can slip and elongate if there is not enough myosin to balance tension. So there is an active rearrangement. If you want to think in terms of springs, there is some rest length of these springs that can change. So there is this slow time scale, and then still there is even slower time scale of mechanical feedback which uh, determines how much myosin and how much contractility uh, these different filaments should exert. So we, we, we think of uh, this kind of a solid as a sort of pretty interesting and non-classical solid. So it's an active solid which can continuously remodel itself. Well, so there is some, uh, some uh, <clears throat> model uh, where we uh, so start thinking of tissue dynamics as an adiabatic rearrangement of myosin controlled force balance. Well, that's just a theory. However, this theory can make predictions and uh, it can be falsified. So <laughs> skipping uh, along, the bottom line is uh, going back to trying to relate, understand morphogenetic flow. Uh, um, you can convince yourself that uh, this uh, flow is effectively described by uh, uh, some continuum equations where velocity obeys pretty much uh, sort of generalized Stokes equation driven by myosin, in particular divergence of myosin tensor. Now the beauty is that I already told you that Sebastian uh, uh, can measure uh, velocity throughout the tissue. And he can also measure the myosin distribution in, in the tissue. So both are directly measurable. And uh, um, Sebastian then uh, goes on and uh, um, so sort of visualizes myosin distribution. Uh, in the embryo, myosin makes these little anisotropic filaments to describe how much myosin there is and what the local anisotropy is. You have to introduce this tensor it is measurable. The bottom line is uh, you take the measurement of uh, this myosin tensor and you solve for the velocity field. And uh, then you compare um, uh, what comes out. So snapshot by snapshot, right? It's a flow, but at each point of time, Sebastian measures uh, myosin distribution, solves the equation, compares to measure the velocity field, and the ridiculous thing is uh, 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 just with three parameters, um, global parameters, no spatial variation of parameters, uh, one can uh, uh, reach so pretty ridiculous uh, uh, accuracy. And the uh, mismatch between uh, this prediction and uh, um, what one observes when it happens is actually very informative because it pinpoints uh, sort of interesting processes in the embryo. So now the question is, what happened to all of, uh, of the complexity? In principle, if uh, somebody g gave you the list of uh, um, 20 or 100 uh, relevant uh, um, genes and proteins, right? 
pretty much uh, knocking out any one of uh, these genes and proteins would uh, uh, mess things up very, very dramatically. Yet, we do not need to measure them in order to make a prediction. Um, and uh, the thought, of course, is that uh, even though there are lots and lots of internal degrees of freedom, they are tightly correlated. So that uh, if you know one, you effectively know the rest of them. And uh, in physics and in mathematics, uh, we know uh, how that can happen. So if you have uh, some uh, interacting system, uh, which is, uh, uh, um, which has so an inertial or so-called central manifold, uh, which means that all of uh, the phase space effectively dynamically collapses on some low dimensional manifold. And uh, then it moves along that uh, low dimensional manifold. So in uh, um, case at hand, this low dimensional manifold would be, or can be parameterized by Mize and tensor as a function of uh, position and uh, time. And then effectively, if you know the position um, on uh, this inertial manifold, uh, you know, the shape of this manifold then determines the state of all other unseen and unmeasured uh, variables. And uh, then of course, uh, you can ask, uh, <clears throat> uh, where does the existence of uh, such an inertial manifold uh, structure come from? And uh, um, uh, to quote uh, Ned uh, and uh, uh, the song that he quoted, well, that's, uh, that's this gift of uh, simplicity. And uh, um, um, as, uh, um, um, my friends uh, speaking uh, uh, earlier already pointed out, of course, uh, the presence of this sort of simplifying structure of course is ultimately, um, well, has to be attributed to evolution. But uh, <clears throat> uh, what I would like to emphasize here is uh, um, <clears throat> ultimately it's uh, uh, thanks go to evolution but it's also the dynamics inside the cells and in, uh, in the tissues that actually tie the dynamical variables together. So um, uh, it's uh, so the property of a dynamical system, which, uh, well, let's call it an evolved property of, of a dynamical system. So uh, I don't know what time it is, but uh, I'm going to finish right now. Um, um, so that with a plug for phenological uh, modeling, I think uh, our panelists don't need particularly uh, be convinced that the phenological modeling had be useful. But uh, if any biologists out there uh, are listening, um, 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 I hope, uh, um, we can collectively um, um, uh, change the attitudes towards phenomenology into something a little more positive. Um, and uh, finally, I finish by acknowledging my uh, friends and uh, collaborators. I've already um, uh, advertised uh, uh, Sebastian uh, Strakan. Um, uh, who was uh, postdoc at KTP, but now is uh, a junior faculty at KTP. And uh, the experimental side uh, uh, was uh, a collaboration with uh, Eric Wishaus and uh, his student, Matt. Um, and on the theory side, uh, um, um, some wonderful postdocs, former postdocs at KTP were involved, Madhav and Itze, and uh, uh, my student, uh, Nick Knoll, who is now actually a postdoc. Uh, and thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you. Questions.
Yes, uh, now it's time for questions. Um, we'll start with the, we're a bit over time, so it's gonna be a pretty short okay. question section, but uh, let's start with the panel first. Does anybody have any questions? I was wondering if in this case, um, um, you talked about this evolved dynamical system in uh, Drosophila, um, is there any sense in which you can ask whether you see that same dimensionality reduction in uh, across the phylogenetic tree? Can or have the other organisms' um, development not been studied as well to ask whether um, this low dimensionality is preserved or if it evolved first? Or well, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, I was just talking about uh, uh, tissue mechanics. And Ilya in the beginning said that uh, we, in fact, are not going to talk about mechanobiology because uh, mechanobiology is physics. And in physics, we, of course, know that uh, things like this is going to happen, um, right? So obvious uh, 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 so reason, if you like, uh, physical reason for you know, having uh, so behind this inertial manifold would be, okay, Force balance is important, and therefore stress tensor is important, and uh, myosin uh, tensor is a stress tensor. Done, finished. And uh, I think that uh, um, uh, force balance would be as important in the blowfly as in Drosophila. But uh, as a general principle, of course, you want to extend this uh, vastly away from uh, uh, just mechanical system. So um, I'm sort of very fond of... Uh, uh, Terry Hua's uh, um, phenological modeling of E. coli physiology. And uh, what he finds there is also that the physiological state of uh, E. coli can be described by a very small number of, uh, of variables, you know, like number of ribosomes. Um, so, so here is a, a very different example of dimensional reduction. More questions? Do we have time for one more? Yeah. I mean, by the way, I would try to get Thierry to give a talk here, but she had, um, she had other commitments. So anyway, next question. I was wondering, did you learn any new biology or um, at the point where your model mismatched the measurements? Yes, so that, that's all the point I wanted to make. Exactly. Uh, um, where things go uh, awry, that's when it actually gets interesting. I'd be happy to talk about that, but uh, Ilya won't be happy. <laughs> we have questions like that actually in the in the YouTube, and so if you can log in after that and answer those questions, uh, that would be great. Um, I will. Any other questions from the panel before I go to YouTube questions? Uh, sorry, I have a question, Ilya or Boris. Yes, go ahead. How how could you how would you identify relevant? How do you know? what the relevant variables are in a problem. That's something you have to come into and think about on your own or is there a way to discover them? Well, uh, um, you know, there's artificial intelligence but there's also natural stupidity. So uh, um, my systematic approach has been natural stupidity. So we just try to think about it. Um, again, where physics comes in, uh, it's, uh, easy because uh, as I say, you know, force balance is important. So you start there. Um, it would be nice to have some universal uh, uh, um, alternative to thinking, but uh, um, um, never found it. Thank you. So let's go for one YouTube question. So uh, this one, comes from uh, Moshe Harsh. Um, the question is, didn't you hide all the complexity by measuring the myosin distribution and then using this information uh, then fitting the model? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. But uh, uh, you can still ask, uh, why is it that we only need to measure uh, myosin distribution, but not myosin distribution and actin distribution and uh, cotherin distribution and uh, rock kinase distribution and uh, um, uh, 50 other things distribution. And uh, that's, I think, uh, where some simpli simplicity has to kick in. Uh, somehow there has to be some sort of uh, feedback connecting all of these uh, 
many um, variables and activities and pie them together. They're all slaved to one common, I would say, mechanical equilibrium. Okay. Uh, so that, another question is um, from Golam Kashev. I was just looking at the velocity fields at the surface of the organism. Is there important stuff happening inside? Well, there is uh, plenty of uh, interesting stuff happening uh, inside. Um, um, but uh, it turns out that at those uh, two hours of uh, development, uh, uh, you know, cell rearrangement is dominated by mechanical forces generated in uh, the epithelial layer on the surface. So in that sense, uh, um, um, if that's what you're interested in, interesting things are happening on the surface. Okay. So another one is from Richard Allard Zinon. How are the fluid dynamics equations for the active flow compatible with the active solid mo model? Oh, it's uh, actually just an intermediate uh, time scale description uh, uh, described derived from the same model. It's a little more technical question. I'll be happy to answer uh, later. later yeah. um, so from Navish Badwa, uh, where does anisotropia in mice and distribution come from? Uh, a very interesting question. That's uh, what we're trying to uh, uh, investigate now. Um, on some level, it is derived from patterns of, uh, so, the pa so the stripy pattern of uh, gene expression, but uh, um, we have uh, uh, some ideas and uh, some evidence that that's not the only story, not the whole story. So there's so the mechanical feedback also that plays a role in uh, generating an isotropy. And it's what's going to be the last question, I guess, from Aditya Chincholi. You had three time scales and land scales pointing to a theory that utilizes a mesoscale, i.e., fluids. Do you think this principle uh, is a good guiding principle in general? I guess what, what they're talking about is a uh, time scale or length scale separation, I guess. I'm not sure. A quick answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. And with that, let's move to the next speaker. If Marta, thank you, Boris, very much. There is a whole lot of other questions online for you. So if you can log in and answer them, that would be great. And thank you very much, everybody, for, for listening. And uh, Ilya, thank you for organizing. So I'd like to thank you all for being there and for the invitation. And we're gonna be switching gear because I'm a neuroscientist and I really resonate with the idea of using simple models. And yet I also know there are some things that simple models just fail to capture. What I wanna do today is just tell you a few stories about places where as an experimentalist, we are able to see things and understand things that we could never approach in today's world um, experimentally. So that's my lab. Um, and so I just want to sort of go back to the beginning and talk about some problems we encountered in building our first models. Now I work on a small circuit um, and one of the challenges that neuroscientists always face, as do all the rest of you, is trying to account for system level behavior in terms of the properties of the individual components. And one of the big, big challenges we all face as biologists is how to deal with the variability in our data. And we first um, encountered this, and I'll show you in a moment, when we tried to build our first detailed computational um, model. And this occurs, this goes back to 1990, when we were doing what was the archetypal um, biophysical problem of the time, and, Till still today, following in the Hodgkin-Huxley tradition, which was to take a neuron, try and characterize all the different voltage and time dependent currents that gave rise to the model's dynamics, and then 
use so use voltage clamp and then fit those currents with Hodgkin Huxley type equations that describe the maximal conductance and the activation and activation properties, ascend up the model, and then attempt to tune it so it showed appropriate behavior. And I just want to talk to you about a couple of the problems we encountered. Um, and the first big problem we encountered was um, when we did our voltage clamp data, like everybody else, we got data that was somewhat variable. And the first problem we had to deal with was to ask the question, should we use mean data from all of our measurements or our best data? And then what does best mean? And I should say there was a prejudice in the biophysics at the time that the best measurements would be the fastest and the biggest, but I wasn't sure that was really true. And so we actually didn't know how to think about the problem of whether to use mean data or best data. And in building this model, we actually did a bit of both. But I wanna come back to this issue of um, mean data in, in a minute. And then the, the final step, of course, was to try and tune the model so it showed appropriate behavior. And the, this model, like all detailed models, was extremely fragile to the parameters. And it was most fragile to the parameters we had the least good data for. And we learned already in 1990 that hand tuning a complex model was a fool's game. It's just too hard. And so one of the things that we, this is one of the things that we no longer do. But I want to um, sort of tell you that at the time, this model was one of the best conductance based models of its time, but I found it very, very unsatisfying. And the big picture consequence of my dissatisfaction with it is what, that the difficulty of tuning it led to the first generation of self-tuning activity dependent models. And today we don't hand tune, but generate large families of models and Astrid Prince at, at Emory there is um, one of the pioneers in this. And so in a sense, doing um, and attempting to do a modeling project actually led not so much to the creation of a, of a successful model, but to revealing the fundamental problems that we hadn't really thought about before. So I wanna just go back to this issue about averaging. So, you know, Jorge Goloash, who did this work, probably might have had 15 measurements of each of the voltage and time dependent currents in the cell that he could measure. And, um, and as I said, we didn't know whether to look at mean or, or complicated data, so, or, or, or best data. But many years later, um, Mark Goldman was building models. These were conductance-based models of neurons. And he made this observation along with Jorge and that is to say he found a hundred, and this was the, one of the first cases of building a large family of models that had certain properties. So he found 150, what he called single spike burster models. And their dynamics look like this. They go up, they have a single spike with a plateau. And here's another one, a single spike and a plateau. And here's another one, a single spike and a plateau. And you can see them here. And then the, these models had five or six different kinds of currents. But what Mark did here is he's showing you the maximal conductance for the sodium current in red and of the delayed rectified its potassium current in yellow. In model one, in model two, notice that what was big in, in model one was very small in model, in, this is model three and model two. Again, they're different. And so then Mark just did the very simple, um, simple experiment and he calculated the means of these sodium channel and potassium channel dynamics and discovered that when he built models from those mean data, he didn't get single spike bursters, but he got a three spike burster. So he had 150 models that were all single spike bursters and the means gave him a three spike burster. And so, Here's the distribution of all those single spike bursters. And then the average brought him out of that part of parameter space. Now, I think any of you who are physicists who've thought about models would know that this was necessarily um, going to happen some of the time. But I think our experimental colleagues or the biophysicists, the cellular biophysicists in neuroscience, were actually quite surprised because it was always the premise that you would count, you would measure the same thing in, in 15 cells or whatever, and then calculate the mean, and then that would be what would go into your model. So that would just gonna 
give rise to the wrong answer. Now, obviously averaging doesn't have to fail, but averaging can fail. And I think this is a very important lesson that came from this process in um, neuroscience. Now, the models that we most often use today um, are again, single compartment models with eight conductances and obviously capacitance given by the membrane. And they have an inward same current, two calcium currents, um, what this is called um, hyperpolarization activated inward current or IH, and then three different potassium currents, and then a leak, which is just a hole. Okay, so I wanna show you very rapidly as a way of revealing something we never could have done biologically. This is a model that bursts, it fires, it depolarizes, and this is voltage against time is here and voltage is here. It fires a burst of action potentials as you're seeing here. And then what Leandro uh, Lanzo, who was a postdoc in the lab did, is he's using conventional biophysics um, terminology. This is zero and he's plotting the outward currents, those are the K currents, up and the inward currents down. So this is the total outward current here in black on a log scale, the total inward current on a log scale. And now, because this is a model, you can look at what's happening to each one of the currents as it evolves in time. So the sodium current is here in red, and the calcium, one of the calcium currents is here in green, and one of the potassium currents is here in purple, and another one of them is here in orange. So this allows us to see in the model exactly how each of the currents is evolving in time. And this is exactly what you'd wanna know as an experimentalist. And this is a measurement you cannot get this way with this kind of precision. And I'm gonna show you just a couple of slides to show you the kinds of intuitions that you can see in these models that you could never directly get um, experimentally. So now Leandro built, following in Astrid's footsteps, here we have six models, each of which is a burster. Their behavior is very, very similar, but they have different parameters for each of the membrane currents. But what's most beautiful in this is if we look at the purple, that's one of the potassium currents. You can see it's really small here and it's enormous here. So even though these two cells have very similar behavior, the contribution of the purple current, that's the A current, to the dynamics of this cell is completely different than its contribution to the dynamics of this system. So there's been a trade-off actually. What's happening that you can see here is there's a trade-off between one of the K currents and the other two K currents. Um, as the, as this evolves. So we have six cells and you can have as many as you want with very, very similar dynamics and very different underlying mechanism. So if you're a biologist and you wanna ask, what is the mechanism by which these cells work? You have to know that this is possible. And I'd just like to show you my most favorite slide of the day, which is we've been doing some work using temperature as a, a way of um, perturbing cells. And here you can see the last spike in the burst, the repolarization from 10 up to 25 degrees. If you look at the purple, it's big here. And as temperature increases, it gets smaller and smaller. And the calcium activated potassium current, another potassium current, gets larger and larger and larger. And this is, this is what, the reason I love this slide is because it shows that as you go through a continuous perturbation, in this case, temperature, you're maintaining very similar function, but you're doing that by smoothly, by making a smooth segue between mechanisms. So there's overlap. These currents are not identical by any imagine, but the cell uses um, channels with overlapping time and voltage dependent properties to actually be able to maintain function despite a very large perturbation. And I think one of the reasons why neurons have 20 or 30 different kinds of ion channels is so they can extend their dynamic range. And that is something that you'll see in complicated models, but you lose in very simple models. Now, I'd just like to go back to the his history, make one or two other points about what you can learn from a model that you can't learn um, or that, that we didn't learn without them. So models can reveal possible features in your data you had no idea were there. And my first example of that, and then models can rapidly suggest answers to biological puzzles. 
and then models can validate a new way of thinking. But the first one is very long time ago. This paper was published in 1990, and we were using a very simple model. This was a Fitzhugh-Nagumo model of an action potential or of an oscillator. And we had data in the lab that showed that when we, um, when we isolated an oscillator from other cells that were electrically coupled, the isolated os oscillator went faster and faster. So the period got smaller and smaller. So when Tom Kepler came to the lab, I asked him just to build this circuit and say, and just show that, that this was true. And what he first found was this, that's to say um, there was a region in which this relationship was found, but he first showed me this. And I said, he had to be had to be wrong, but it turned out that he very quickly pointed out that depending on the parameters of the cell, you could have two totally different behaviors. And I had no idea that an oscillator with this behavior could be seen, although the minute we knew it, when we saw one biologically, we recognized it. So this was a case where our biological system had showed us one case. We had no idea the other case existed. And with the you know, two differential equations, um, Tom was able to show us we should look for this as well. And this happens all the time. Now, moving along, um, the second instance was in response to our difficulty building models, we realized that neurons have a very complicated problem to face, which is the neurons are alive for many, many years, but ion channels and receptors in the membrane are turning over very quickly. And so the question is, how did the cell maintain stability despite the nervous system constantly rebuilding itself? And so this led to a series of homeostatic or self-tuning models that arose precisely because we had so much trouble building the more simplistic models that we had originally started. And then I would just like to say that I showed you an example of six neurons in, in the case before that had very similar behavior, but very different underlying structures, or at least quantitatively underlying structures. And this was um, uh, led to the fact that today, we no longer build, build single models. We build families of models that capture the range, ranges of our biological data, rather than trying to capture the variance of the biological data in a single model. So it's much easier to say, I'm going to build a whole bunch of models that have certain phenomenological properties, and you decide what the constraints on those phenomenological properties are going to be on the basis of your data. And then you look to see how those different variations of the model um, give you insight into how the individual, how the biology is working. And this is a transformation, and it's precisely because we can build multiple models to capture the variance of our data that we can see things we never would have seen had we tried to build more straightforward models. And I'll stop there. Thank you, If um, So we're, again, a bit short on time for the discussion. So why don't we open it up for the, for the panel? I have a question. I'm, I'm wondering whether you think this variability is just, you know, inevitable byproduct of fluctuations or if this is actually advantageous, maybe at least in some of the systems you've been looking at. I think it's both. I think it's inevitable. The animals that we study are five or six years old. And I think, I think there's something I didn't say that I think is very important, which is every place that people have looked in any, um, component process. There's about a two to six fold range in that parameter. And, you know, Ron Calabri saw the same things at, at Emory. We see it, everybody sees it. And I think that two to six fold um, it is a really important number because it allows you to get a family of solutions, um, but it also lets you avoid having to tune, tune to a solution that's 0.1%, which there's no way these neurons could ever do. It's just too hard. So I think that you have an accrual of sort of variance. I mean, these animals are five or six years old and you know they're they're wandering around in conductance space. But I think that two to six fold is a really important number that puts you into 
the place of successful solutions. Thank you. Any, any other questions? So there yeah. is the, yeah, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. <laughs> Somebody go ahead. Okay, so who's going ahead? Yeah. Boris, Boris is going first. Okay. <laughs> so there, there is a variability, but uh, there is also uh, uh, homeostasis uh, event. I, I, I didn't quite understand uh, in this example that you gave uh, with temperature variation, you showed that uh, there is uh, internal variation, but it's buffered so that the visible spike is essentially constant in shape. Well, I went through things too quickly. I showed you two slides. One uh -huh. slide was six models at the same temperature with different underlying um, values for the conductance densities for the different channels. And then I showed you an example where we varied temperature. What all those models do, they increase in frequency, but Leandro found them to be because he was looking for models that would be able to be robust to temperature over ranges from five degrees to 25 degrees. And they all are, they get faster, but the structure of the burst maintains itself. Does that help? Yeah. Lenoy, did you? Yeah. yeah, thank you. That was, uh, thank you for a beautiful talk. I was wondering what happens if your family of models um, is varying on an aspect that your data does not? How do you know if it's a feature or a bug? Um, I think we would not know until we went to look, right? And so I think these models are, are much simpler than our cells, right? These models are built with eight currents per cell. Our cells certainly have many more than that, plus they have all their structure. So I think the, the variability in what we put into the models is probably gonna be found in everything in the real cells, but the real cells are also gonna have a lot more things happening that are variable that might influence these things. And I didn't talk about it, but Astrid's worked on this and we've done a lot of work looking at correlations in the expression of these different channels. Okay. So that's so, fine. Thanks. I wanna point out that in some sense, uh, I think what you are talking about and what uh, Arvind was talking about and Boris, right? Sort of this emergence well, of soft modes, right? These are examples of very similar behaviors across systems, which are, you know, neurons, evolution of proteins, and 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 mechanics. And maybe there is some general truth somewhere there that function forces us to be in that corner um, and create this sort of sloppy model, sloppy behaviors, right? So I'm, we're going to go to one question from YouTube, and it's going to be unfortunately the only one due to time. So Moshe Harsh, um, how do uh, how do we make uh, how do we make an ensemble of these models to make a prediction? Would simply, if you want to make a prediction with a model, how do you weigh the different models to give you the prediction? I think you have to have a question to know what you're trying to predict. So I, I, you know, I think I well, I don't want to be rude, but I'm going to be rude, and I would say that the question about prediction is sort of um, not always the right question. Every time we built a model, we revealed something we didn't know, and that then drove us back to biology. So you can say that was a prediction, um, but the predictions, people mean different things by predictions. So for example, um, when, when we first, the, our difficulty in tuning conductance-based models created the prediction that the cells might have, must have rules that allowed them to self-tune. And so that was a very global prediction. It's taken the field 20 years to try and understand that. And there's a whole subfield of neuroscience that is studying the predictions of that first 1993 model. So, you know, I think it's, it's very obvious when, you know, you have a problem and then you build a model that sort of gives you a half answer or an answer, a suggested answer, and you just go and do the experiments. Thank you. I think that uh, with this, we're going to switch to the next uh, to the next speaker, to um, Thierry Mora. Thank you. you. Thierry, please share your screen. Yes. 
So hello. So first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for putting this workshop together. So far, it's been a blast. And so uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the immune system and the role of theory uh, in immunology. And more specific, specifically, I will talk about the adaptive immune system. Uh, so B and T cell receptors are the, so the B and T cells are the main players of the adaptive immune system, and they each carry their own unique receptor. Uh, and uh, in our body, we harbor like a, you know, a very large number of such receptors and the diversity of these receptors is necessary to be able to tackle and defend ourselves against the many different, different pathogens that may attack us. And so the, the general questions we, we want to answer is how is the repertoire of these T cell and B cell receptors, so could this repertoire, the set of the different receptors we express, uh, organized to ensure good protection against those pathogens. And so, um, so recently what's changed in the past 10 years or so is that we've been able to access uh, to sequencing data. So essentially long lists of these B and T cell receptors taken from uh, samples, for instance, from blood uh, in each uh, individual. So that's the general question, of course. And uh, here I'm just going to narrow, down, narrow it down on one specific question to, to illustrate the question of, uh, of prediction and, and putting data and theory on the same block. So that what I'm going to talk about is the, the question of public immune repertoires. So what does that mean? So take, let's say, uh, three individuals and, and draw the list of all the receptors they have. So here you see the amino acid sequences of an uh, important part of these receptors. And then you can ask for each receptor and how many individuals that you see it, right? So here, uh, 15 such uh, sequences were seen in just one individual, so it would be purely private sequences. Four of them were seen in two individuals and one of them was seen in all three of them. Right? So this is of course a cartoon. You can actually do this in the data and you can do this on a cohort of uh, more than 600 people. And uh, you can plot the, the experimental results. So this is what you get. And you can see that the, you know, the vast majority of sequences is actually private, but then you also uh, get quite a large number of sequences that are uh, shared by everyone. So these are the, the guys at the right end of the spectrum and pretty much everything in between. And see here, uh, we, we observe this kind of nice power law. So we you know, uh, as physicists, we always like power law. So you know, it suggests maybe something interesting. And so we like to understand uh, what kind of theory can try to, can help us explain and predict that uh, particular uh, experimental curve, right? And so, so what do we have at our disposal as theorists to answer this question? And so I will draw a spectrum of theories, which is very much like what's been shown before. Uh, at one extreme, you have, so, so to speak, normative models. So these are very broad models that try from very first principles to explain a broad set of, uh, of uh, observations, but are not necessarily very quantitative. Uh, they're just you know, an explanatory framework, if you like. And then on the right hand side, you, you have a, you know, very data driven models. So these are more like statistical models whose aim is really to fit the, the experimental data that's at hand uh, as best as possible. Right? And in between, you have more mechanistic models like biophysical models. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm making this, uh, this uh, I'm drawing this spectrum because I want to talk to you about two very widely different approaches that basically lie on opposite ends of the spectrum. So first I'll tell you about a theory of optimal repertoires to try to answer the, this question of sharing. And then second, I, I, I'll move on to uh, data-driven kind of models to answer this question. So let me start with the first part. So uh, it's a theory of efficient immunity. And so for those who are familiar with it, this is like the immune system uh, equivalent of the efficient coding hypothesis in neuroscience. The idea is that the immune system actually is uh, optimally adapted to uh, the statistics of its environment. So what does that mean? That means that knowing the knowledge that the immune system has uh, accumulated over, over the years, it would try to minimize the expected cost of future infections, right? So it's a, it's a decision problem. And the implication of this is that the distribution of receptors, which are specific to each uh, pathogen, should be optimally matched to the distribution of the, of the pathogens themselves, right? So you can cast this in, uh, into a, a Bayesian uh, decision dynamics process, and uh, the, this is how it goes. The, the, the main prediction uh, of this, I will not, won't go into the mathematical details, is that if you see something, if you actually encounter a pathogen, you should update your, your, not your belief about what the frequency of that pathogen is, and therefore you should also update 
how many uh, receptors, how many uh, specific cells you have to fight that particular pathogen to uh, minimize the cost of future infections, right? And this is actually what happens in the actual immune system after we encounter, uh, uh, after we get infected with a bug. After that, we keep a pool of memory cells uh, in case of future infections, right? So this is like a very, at this point, qualitative uh, prediction. I mean, it's a post prediction, if you like, right? It's kind of uh, baked off and baked into the model. Uh, another prediction is that this memory should decay with time as the, the knowledge uh, of the of the encounter becomes obsolete because pathogens evolve. Uh, so you can then do semi-quantitative predictions, right? Uh, so, for instance, th this is just one example. Uh, the, the prediction from this theory is that when you get reinfected with something, so the second time you see a pathogen. Your, the uh, immune response that you mount should be smaller than the first encounter. And the reason for this, according to this theory, is that the second time you see something, you're less surprised. This uh, basically amounts to less information. And all you want to do is just, uh, you know, basically confirm the first observation so you should have a smaller response. And this is actually the prediction of the theory. You can actually plot this in front of the, you know, uh, um, the same plot as the experiment. But I want to point, point out here that here the fit is not very stringent. Here is really what we're capturing mostly is the threat, right? So again, this is more an example where the, the theory uh, really tries to get the broad uh, features of the data, not necessarily fits every single point. Okay, so now how can we use this theory to answer the question I asked, which is to predict the sharing number, so the amount of sharing between repertoires of, uh, of unrelated individuals. So uh, to, to answer the question, you can do it with, within the model, but you need to add one a uh, more piece of, uh, of, uh, of data, you know, one more observation, which is that we know there's degeneracy recognition, meaning that the same pathogen can actually be recognized by many different receptors. And because of this degeneracy, one can show, and this was known already in ecology in the context of, in the, under the name of competitive exclusion, that if two individuals see almost the exact same pathogenic environment, they will end up to have optimal repertoires that are completely different, right? And so therefore they should not share any sequences at all. Or actually that's not true. Maybe they should share some because sometimes some of these peaks will actually be by coincidence in the same place. So all the sharing you should see should be completely by chance, right? Now the thing, that, the, the, the insight that's given by this uh, model is not very quantitative. It just tells you, tells you it should happen by chance. But what do we mean by chance? And this is where we need to go to the second part where we actually need a quantitative model. So what do we mean by chance? For that, I need to tell you what distribution the receptors are drawn from, right? And so for that, I can actually use the data and uh, also some biophysical knowledge we have about how the sequences are generated. They're generated by a process of DNA editing called PDG recombination. And so from the sequencing data we have, we can actually learn the priority distribution over the se those sequences in the form of this PDG recombination plus selection. And from, you know, uh, what comes out of this uh, process uh, of this modeling it is purely, you know, you, so you train the model directly on the data and what comes out is a predicted priority distribution of uh, over all possible sequences of these receptors. And so you, you can actually check that the, 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 the model works well in predicting the frequency, but then you can also ask, what if I now generate synthetic repertoires from this model, 600 of them or something, and then try to see whether it actually explains the sharing, right? So that it would work only if the sharing was actually completely coincidental uh, as, a, as the qualitative theory was predicting. And so that's, that's what the fit gives. And that's actually not a fit. I mean, it's just a, a parameter-free prediction. And you can see uh, it works very well, both for T cells and for B cells, two different data set, two different models also. And we also have, a, I want to mention, we also have a nice analytical formula for actually predicting the sharing number from the distribution of probabilities. So here, uh, you, you know, you see a, a very good agreement, but uh, I think what's actually interesting uh, is when the theory fails, because here this prediction is for people who are, uh, the individuals who, who gave their blood for these uh, repertoires are mostly healthy. And so it's interesting to, to now ask what's happening in the context of disease, like there's a disorder, right? And uh, so this is what I call a failure as success. So there are two examples here from, from our, our research. 
One is uh, in a cohort of, uh, of people who all have a chronic infection called cytomegalovirus, or CMV. And you can see that uh, on the, that's on the left-hand side, that some sequences shown in red actually overshare between uh, these people. So these sequences actually, they're more present in these people than you would have expected from the model, right? And uh, these are actually validated to be specific to this virus, right? So here, the failure of the model actually tells you what sequences may be involved uh, in, in the immune response. Then the, the, the second example is a very recent one from, uh, from uh, COVID-19 positive donors. Uh, and here is a different view, but like this is again the sharing number I was showing you before, only we just have a much smaller cohort. And uh, in black, you can see the, the prediction from healthy people or the model. And uh, the crosses show actually the sharing number for people for, who are, who, who are, uh, whose uh, repertoire was taken at the peak of the infection with uh, COVID-19. And here you can see that actually it doesn't, the model doesn't work at all. And the explanation, that's what we think, is that uh, this over, over representation of sharing between these people is because there's a convergence response of all these people uh, in response to COVID-19. And so uh, I'm, I'm sort of done. So I've talked to you about two extremes of that spectrum. And I think, uh, you know, what's, in, in a way, what's kind of uh, missing from this picture, and uh, including in the sharing analysis, is any relation to function. Because we actually don't know, if I give you a sequence, we don't know what pathogen actually recognized for the most part, right? So there's a kind of the, the, the we need this part to be able to relate the high level theories, the, pre, you know, the, the sort of normative theories with the more data driven theories. And so we, we're in the process of investigating this uh, using either uh, in vitro or in vivo uh, experiments to try to, to map out, to do this mapping between the receptors and the pathogens that I respond to. And uh, we'll, uh, I'll uh, stop and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Thierry. Uh, and as always, let's start with the panel. I think Boris wants to ask a question. Yeah. Wonderful, Dr. Uh, so I, I didn't understand. So in uh, this uh, anomaly you observe um, for COVID uh, infected, uh, COVID positive people. So is it uh, COVID or is it uh, any acute viral response that's going to uh, uh, cause an anomaly? So uh, we don't know because this experiment has never been performed for that many people for any other infection than COVID. So not for flu, for example. Well, I, I, that's what I'm saying. Like if somebody did the experiment of uh, taking patients who are hospitalized for flu, right? And take the repertoire yeah. at the peak of the symptoms, uh, then you might actually find the same answer, right? So, we, but the, then you know that these people are hospitalized for flu, right? Yep. Uh, if you do this in, 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 in recovering patients, even this won't work, right? If you take some, uh, yeah, okay. that only works at the peak of the infection. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the panel? So I have uh, one, right? So, so what I want to understand, Thierry, is uh, not the details of the of the talk, but sort of going back to the uh, whole point, sort of in some sense of the workshop. Um, where does the precise quantitative theory uh, help you, or helped you in this particular in this particular case? Just can you highlight that, please, or maybe it didn't. Well, okay. So, so, so of course, I, I presented it the the other way around, right? So. What we did is that we first actually did all this fitting. You know, we started this, uh, you know, quite a while ago, and we've been refining it, right? And then we 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 asked whether we can actually predict the sharing number with it, right? right. So for us, it was useful because it was actually a, a validation that our model was capturing the, the true statistics. The other thing is that, which I, I didn't re really insist on because this is more like a, a question within immunology, that the question of public repertoires has been you know, quite a big question in immunology for a while. And why is that? It's because uh, the public repertoire is the idea that we all share a, a pool of common sequences. 
And that's important, for instance, if you want to design vaccines or immunotherapies or this sort of thing, right? It's also important for immunologists because this is closer to something that would be like innate immunity within adaptive immunity. So if we all have this you know, baseline uh, of shared sequences, then it, may, it might actually mean that we all respond in the same way, right? The other aspect is that if people, uh, you know, responding to the same, uh, uh, responding to the same infection should have convergent response as we see at the peak of the response. Maybe that's also true at the level of the memory. So at the level of the circulating cells, right? Not at the peak of the infection. So then you would have expected a, a big uh, 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 departure between the theory and the data. You would have had much more uh, sharing than the, than the theory would have predicted just because people all responded to the same bugs, right? So to, to us, this is important to show that in fact, it is still consistent completely with chance, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think for immunologists is, 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 is not a completely obvious result, right? Because right. immunologists really like to think in cohorts that cohorts should all behave in the same way, not just by chance. Okay, um, the question from YouTube, um, so from Alan K, did you look at the role of lymphocyte education? Of lymphocyte education, I presume that you. That I you think that's timing selection. So, uh, um, so lymphocyte education is actually included in the model. So that's why I say plus selection. It's actually thamic selection. So it's not actually uh, selection by disease because otherwise that would be the purpose. So we we have a video recombination model for that, and then we add a layer of common selection to everybody, which is kind of a baseline for everyone, uh, which we believe just a test for functionality of the, of the cell. So that, that would be related to so the answer is yes, it's, it's taken into account. So another question is from Eric Di Giuli. Uh, can you exclude that the anomalous correlation is not due to the susceptibility to the particular virus rather than due to the response? So, so can you, sorry, can you say it again? Can you exclude that this anomalous correlation, I presume they're talking about this uh, sharing number, is not due to susceptibility to the virus, but rather due to the response. Anomalous co correlation. I mean, so you mean like the, 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 here the departure from between the- Yes, I suspect that this is what they're talking about. And so the well, that's precisely it. I mean, the, 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 these outliers are there because there's the virus, right? And that's, that's what we're claiming. We're claiming that this departure actually can be used as a signature to, to single out uh, the, the, the guys who hear the receptors that are involved in response. Okay, got it. Um, anybody else has any questions from the panel? Well, if not, then we're going to end this uh, session. Uh, thank you very much, Thierry. So we are going to break till 12.25. Uh, but before that, I'm going to be, um, uh, I'm going to uh, let Linoy Michelin take the uh, control for a few minutes and explain what we're going to be doing over this break. So Linoy, please, it's your turn. Yes, thank you, Ilya. So I just wanted to have a quick poll over the break, if you're willing to cooperate. So the question is, is the model doing well? Um, the plot is the plot on the left. And you should, if you're in the States, then the number is on top for you to text either good model with no spaces, it's not case sensitive, or bad model if you think the model is not doing well. And if you're um, around your screen uh, and outside the US, or if you just want to do this via the web, then you can also see on top the polyv.com slash Linoi to respond there. Okay. And then we'll see you all in about uh, seven minutes. Thank you.
Wow, people have really high standards. I like it. I think what's more likely is that people are anticipating um, a bait and switch of, of sorts <laughs> or anticipating that you wouldn't put this on the screen if this was a good model. No, how much better can it get? <laughs> I, that, but I think people, people are expecting that you wouldn't put it here if it was really good. But I, mean, I, I voted yes, I said good model. <laughs> Oh, I like high standards. Just uh... I mean, all things fall within error bars, give or take, right? There is maybe a couple of your standard deviation errors. Okay, it's 12.25 according to my clock. So let's start. We have 49 answers and I guess it's what... Uh, Right, it's people can keep separated. on. It's more separated than US elections, right? Uh, so it's like this would be called the landslide in, in US elections, that this is a good model. Yes, people have high standards. I like it. Um, people can keep on voting. Let me. Um... Go ahead, Lena. Thanks. Yes. Me. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we, I, I asked this question in the poll because this is basically the question that motivates the talk. The looking at this kind of plot where we plot the model and the data on the same axis. And we're asking, okay, is this good enough? So do we need to get this exactly right? Or if it wiggles the same, is this right? Um, and we recently had the opportunity to have a very fertile ground and for, a, for testing of this question of in a rigorous way, what does it mean for a model to be successful? And this is what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and I think if uh, Ned in the morning said his talk is actually better described by the Rolling Stones, you can't always get what you want, then this talk is the, but if you try sometimes, you get what you need. So let's, let's see what it means to try. Um, so this is the plot I was uh, showing you in the poll. Let's say that your wish did come true and I'm intentionally not showing you here um, the axis. So it doesn't matter what is it that I'm plotting, this is a measure, the data and the model. And of course, if the curves overlap more, then that's a higher quantitative agreement. And uh, our heart's desire in this situation is going to be that the model falls within um, experimental error bars, right? And maybe one prediction here that I'm showing you a measure is not uh, enough. So let me show you another one. We can plot the model and the data against each other. And the more it falls on the diagonal, the more there is a, a higher agreement. And so it's also maybe doing pretty well. Let's see what most people thought here. So yeah, high standards. Is this model doing well? Most people thought uh, 55, 57% that uh, the model was good. 43% um, the model was bad. And maybe the question here is not quite binary, right? Maybe the question is, well, it depends. What does it depend on? It depends if you care a lot about the higher range values here, like the higher values, then you'll see that the two largest values are off. Maybe that's not what you want. Maybe it also depends on what is it that you're plotting. Maybe that's a very minor feature of the model, um, which maybe we care less about this being in agreement with the data. And maybe one is just not enough. You need to show me 10 of those for me to decide if the model is good or not good. So let's see. Uh, before I keep on going, I just want to say that uh, everything I'm about to show you today is the collaboration at Princeton University. The experiment side um, are by Jeff Gauthier and David Tank and the theory are Bill Bialik and myself. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about this testing round for simple models. First, what is our system? And then what is the model we're writing down? And then we shall discuss what does it mean for the model to be a success? What is our system? Our system is mouse brain hippocampus. It's gonna be in vivo imaging of about 2000 neurons. So in gray, you can see the brain of a mouse and in blue, the hippocampus. And this is two photon microscopy over the brain of the mouse as the mouse is running down a virtual linear track. And every fluorescent circle here is a neuron. So this is a movie that's slowed down by a factor of about two and every flash of light is activity of a neuron. The neurons are expressing a genetic dye. So the um, activity and the fluorescent corresponds to how active they are. And you can immediately see two things. First of all, interactions here are pretty complex and not 
easily coherent just from looking at them. And second, it's really pretty, which is to say it's a lot of neurons, right? And so any kind of inference we are about to do here is very be, going to be very computationally um, intense. And so what we're going to do is out of these 2,000 neurons, take groups of 100 neurons and write down the same kind of model for all of them and see what we can say about the system. And what is the model we're going to write down? So the simplest possible. The simplest possible means that the first thing we do is take the fluorescent trajectory, uh, the activity of every neuron. We're going to binarize it. For every moment in time there was no activity, we'll put a zero. For every moment in time that the neuron was active, we'll put a one. And we shall do this for all the 100 neurons in the system. And then for every time shot, like uh, 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 moment in time, uh, there is a configuration of uh, silence and activity for the neurons. There is a state for the whole population of neurons. We can look at all these time shots um, and we will decide what are the constraints that we are going to put in the model. So we should take only the things that we can measure really, really well and let everything else be as disordered that it wants. So the two things we are going to put in are going to be the mean activity of each one of the neurons and the pairwise correlations, second order model. Second order model for the joint probability distribution of these configurations of silence and activity. This Ising model with competing interactions is the maximum entropy model for the system, which is to say the distribution with the minimum number of assumptions other than the two constraints that we put in. So we're going to put in the mean activity, the pairwise correlations, infer the H's and the J's, and obtain this probability distribution, which is to say a number for every configuration. Once we have a number for every configuration, we can sample from the distribution. And now we can ask, I'm gonna measure something on the samples from the data, and I'm gonna measure the same thing on the samples from the model, and I'll compare them. And the advantage here is because the model is so simple, it's just a second order model, anything else that we shall be asking, other than just the pairwise correlations, which is just the fit, is a prediction of this model. So we can look at all kinds of predictions to probe how well is this model done. And so we know this family of models is doing very well. It has worked well in multiple systems before. It has worked well for, uh, in our hands in the hippocampus before. Um, and uh, for, for groups of uh, these 100 neurons. And what we're going to do now is take 100 neurons from the whole spatial scale of what's happening here. So the points that I'm showing you on the picture in red are the neurons that uh, we took out of the full 2000 neuron group. And I'm showing you now multiple predictions that we can have. So I'm showing you three of the predictions that out of the six or seven that we can have. And I'm not so much going to go into what exactly is it that I'm plotting rather than just how well do they actually match the data and the model. Or if you want in the right prediction to go on the logistic function, which is where it should be. And well, maybe on the left, you can see that it kind of wiggles the same in the energy plot and maybe you know, where we have smaller error bars, it kind of looks the same in the middle. Um, and on the right, it's pretty off, but it's unclear if we should be declaring success here or not, right? I can say, well, that's success. It kind of wiggles the same. It's very hard to get the model to get anywhere near that and plot on the same axis, so that's okay. And maybe not so convincing. So let's try to now take a group of neurons that are in a smaller spatial scale. So from a smaller radius. And let's plot the same predictions. So I'm showing you again three examples of the same predictions out of the many that we have. And you can immediately see that things have gotten somewhat tighter, right? So we are now in a, a point where most things are within experimental error bars, definitely on the left. On the right, with the effective field prediction, it's still a little off, but for the majority of the data, it's on. Um, and, and we're doing pretty well. Again, um, I'll just stress that the fit is equally excellent for everything that I'm showing you in every radius. It is only the predictions that change in their quality, only the quantitative agreement between the data and the model, which is what we're seeking here. And so let's take an even tighter radius. Let's take a group of neurons that is really as if we just had a, a microscope with a smaller range. And so let's plot again the same three predictions. And you can immediately see that this is much harder to argue that it's hard to, whether it's success or not, right? So that is, get, that is very, very tight in most of the things. It's a little wiggly um, on the right, but it is, I'm gonna tell you, this is as good as it gets. And so that's kind of hard to know what's happening, right? Because 
in the first time that we took the sample of the neurons from the larger radius, some of the plots there looked like success. And had I not shown you the other, maybe we would have been content with that. Let's look at all of them together for a moment as perspective for what does it mean for us to have success here. Um, so that's the tightest, the tightest radius, right? The smallest one, a larger one, and an even larger one. And looking at all of them together, maybe now we have more perspective as to what exactly here is success. I'm gonna point out to you, as you're looking at this, that this one was the one in the poll, where majority of you thought is a good model. To be fair, I do think it's a good model. So other than two points here, the match is pretty good and is pretty within experimental error. But suddenly we have all this other perspective, right? If I only show you this one, maybe you don't know how hard is it to actually get so close. And so there is no perspective. And maybe also you don't know how the other predictions are doing. And so it's just hard to know how good the model really is. So this really big data set that we now have access to has let us have this more perspective into what does it mean to get this model exactly right. And as it turns out, getting it exactly right means something. We care, right? Because that means that the collective coherence of this group is higher. When the predictions are exactly tight in the hippocampus of the mouse, that actually probably means that we are very close together because there is some correlation structure that's happening between the neurons. And the way in which we chose the group is that the correlation structure that the model was fit to in every one of these groups was as close as we could get. So when we chose the neurons for each one of the groups, we swapped them such in a random way such that the correlation uh, structure that we fit did not change much. So this really has to do with the uh, collective activity of this network. And so out of, after doing, uh, I think we had three data sets and um, hundreds of these plotted predictions because we had multiple repeats for five different radii, um, we have some insights. So as it turns out, what I was showing you before that when the radius increases, so we're sampling from a larger spatial scale, the quality of the predictions overall goes down is a real trend over all these hundreds of predictions. And it matters where you're at and it matters to get this exact, if it gets exactly right or a little bit off and just like the wiggle. And so agreement with the data is a function of spatial scale in the system. Another lesson that we have from having this enormous testing round is that maybe you can see, I'm showing three predictions here, but it's true with the others as well, is that not all pred predictions are not born equal. So not every prediction is as easy to get as another. Some predictions are harder to get in a consistent manner. The predictions vary in their difficulty. There are some that are always harder to get, even in the higher quality, tighter radio situation, and some that are actually much harder to get, and they're always um, uh, harder to get. And so this is what I mostly wanted to leave you with, that we now have this testing ground because of this amazing new experimental setup in the tank lab, um, where we could run these simple models that have been incredibly successful before these Ising models, the maximum entropy models that only have uh, second order constraints. We ran tens of these models. We have hundreds of the predictions and we can see trends and what does it mean for a model to work or how good does it get? We can now answer because we have, as Eve said before, a whole family and many, many examples. And so the two main insights are the quantitative agreement within experimental error bar matters. And for that, um, in, in that sense, I also wanna say, if we never plot things on the same axis, we'll never know if we can get there and how well we can do, which as it turns out, sometimes we can do really well if we try. Um, and in the system, in the Mount Sipa campus, larger spatial scale, scale for our samples means that the quality of predictions actually goes down. It means something about the system. Also predictions are not born equal. What we thought does matter. In the hippocampus, some predictions are systematically harder to get right than others. And so not getting a model exactly right is informative about the system. Thank you. Thank you, Lenoy. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to a couple of questions from uh, YouTube, which were, uh, which showed up during the break, right? There's a lot of people arguing that the question that you posed is incorrect, right? That the, uh, it's not that whether the model is good or a model is bad, the question is bad. And maybe 
uh, another way of saying this or a related way of saying this is that bad model doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the fit is not good. It could also mean that the model has too many moving parts, too many parameters. And then this is a comment that came from Daniel Fisher. And so I wonder if you can comment on some of that, right? Uh, yeah, let me say two things. First of all, the question was intentionally provocative. Um, as, as you can see, I, I agree that this is not the, the right way to phrase the question. It's not really about how good is one model. It's more about how good can it get and what does it mean and how many predictions do we have? And it's a, it's a whole, it's a holistic, it's a, it's a whole approach and looking at everything is what matters. Also, I didn't give you the information that the fit is actually equally good and is excellent for all the predictions that I showed you. Um, and uh, I think there was a second part to the question. Can you repeat? Uh, the models may be bad, not because they don't Oh yeah, um, right. So really something to say about maximum entropy models. Uh, we, the number of parameter scales, like uh, the number of neurons squared, which means that we have many, many, many of them. Of course, there are many moving parts here. That being said, that's the other side of the coin of the fact that it's the maximum entropy, right? So it's the minimal number of assumptions. Um, and we have a lot of flexibility. That is the strength and the weakness, right? The more assumptions you put in, the less you have many parameters to play with, which means that you have put in assumptions that now you can't test. So that depends on your choice. Here, the choice was let's go as simple as possible in the expense of having more parameters. Um, and see how well we can do. Mind you, in that um, as a comment to this, many moving parameters oftentimes also set, also means that maybe you're not doing that well. And here, these models are actually excellent for the system. So that's something to know. Do we have questions from the panel before I continue with YouTube? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So I was curious what your interpret, not first of all, very nice talk. Uh, and I have a question about how you interpret What's your idea for what's going on in the hippocampus that's causing this, diff this systematic difference? Yeah, so there, there's another other part of the story that I did not include in this, uh, you know, 10 minute talk because I was focusing on the on the uh, on the part of the models, which which was very insightful. And so thank you for the question. Um, maybe one thing to note is that had I shown you the correlation structure as uh, as a function of distance, um, it would have been less the way you would expect it. So you'd think that from what I'm saying right now, that there is a heavy dependence um, of the correlation on the distance. That is not actually the case. There is a little bit of dependence at the like at very, very small scale. Um, but after that, not so much. Uh, and so this kind of retrieve, there, there is literature about this. We're not the first ones to, to point this out, that um, there is the, the locality in CA1, which is the subregion of the campus, this was, uh, we, we played with, um, actually matters. It matters when you try to stimulate, it matters when you um, look at the amount of kind of collective uh, features of what's happening in the network. And so I guess in a cautious way, um, my interpretation would be that the um, smaller, tighter radius networks are, are more coherent and more uh, collective and function more as a, as a, as a, as a tighter network than the, the broader ones, which are still, um, very interacting, right? It's still doing well, but but not as much as the as the really excellent predictions of the of the very of the very tighter one. Um, maybe if you have in mind uh, the success of these predictions in say work in the retina that um, has um, happened before by Alan Schneiman and Gashford Tactic in in the Bialy group, um, then you remember that some of the predictions work really well. And for some of them, we actually had, they actually had to use more information, which is to say um, mm -hmm. other systems, right? Like the retina, like Salamander retina are actually somewhere in the middle of the predictions that I show you today. Not so much in the, in the how good is the tightest one and not in the kind of bad ones, but somewhere in the middle. So it kind of gives us a, a perspective for when we look at the predictions and we do this in other uh, systems, where are we and how good this can get. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions, Thierry? Yeah, I, I was wondering uh, what's your take on what what are the constraints we should uh, we should put into the model? So what are what are the things that we should really care about? What, what's what's guiding this choice? Uh, because simplicity is is why you do maximum entropy, but then you still need to make choices. And and uh, I'm wondering what's motivating this. Yeah, so I guess I have a, um, a partial answer to that. I'm not sure I have, uh, I, let, me, let me say a, like a, a macro answer first, macro level answer, which is that 
first of all, the choice of putting in only activity features and not behavioral features. So the mouse is actually running down a track here. There is spatial information. This is the hippocampus. There are play styles. There are multiple things one could put in here that we know about the system. So that choice had to do with we would actually like to not know things that are not uh, apparent to the neurons, right? So we would like to only have access to the things that the neurons have access to. A neuron is connected to its friends and the correlation between them is what the neuron sees. So that is what the kind of overall is guiding that. Whether to choose pairwise or triplets or, or maybe uh, a, a K active ones or, or a completely different activity feature, I haven't tried with these models. Um, I, I tend to believe that correlation in this particular system, because we know how well it's doing, um, is, is a very good thing to, to, to take because we, we measure it really, really well. This is like 40 minutes of recording and we can really trust them. Um, but if you have other suggestions for interesting other things that might be able to constrain well, I'm happy to check. Uh, I just wanted to know like, your, what, what your opinion was. Uh, thank you. I think this is, this is quite a, yeah, yeah. this is well motivated. Thanks. So the question from Eric van Nimwegen, isn't it still plausible that a simpler model with fewer parameters could still do better? That is, for example, a model that only allows non-zero JIJs for only close pairs. Show me. I don't know that there is a model that is uh, not taking into consideration a lot more information that is, uh, this model does not, that does better on these measures and even on others. Happy to look at it. It's, I, I can't say it's impossible because I haven't tried that particular thing. My intuition is this is kind of as good as it gets. I'm happy to see otherwise. Show me, I'd, I'd be delighted. So another question from Navish Vatva. Uh, can one extend these ideas to neurons that are far away but still are talking to each other, presumably? You know, uh, so happens. that's a question of, uh, I guess that's a, that's a, that depends if you ask a neuroscientist or, uh, or, or someone else. Uh, so what does it mean for neurons to be talking to each other? They're talking to each other only if they're one synapse away, or are they talking to each other because they're just in the same brain? Um, because that's, that, is a hard, that is a hard definition. I think um, looking at these models for neurons that interact through other neurons and maybe farther away um, is definitely an interesting thing to do. One would like to have some certain of uh, some some minimal amount of like information that is actually being coded and is shared between these neurons and and, and the correlation level. Um, I think it's incredibly important that the neurons are simultaneously recorded and that they have some level of coherence. And so that is why we went to the system. But yeah, definitely can try to do this on uh, situation. I think you, the the motivation to this question is correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe something like you're thinking, well, neuropixels or something that does like a vertical, um, uh, maybe like physiology rather than like a, just a field of view of the, of the imaging. Um, there was a reason we chose the imaging here, which was this is like a really well suited uh, system for this. We didn't know this was going to work well when we started this, but we can definitely try other things. Okay, it's gonna be last question. This is from Daniel Fisher. Um, and I'm also Hi. going to edit it uh, a bit. So um, maximum entropy is as much a religion, religion as a principle. It only corresponds to minimal assumptions under very strong assumptions roughly equivalent to approximate independence of subsystems in physics, right? And I will add to this a bit more that, uh, I mean, you are choosing to work, for example, on the binary systems, right? Binary uh, discretization of neurons where defining entropy is not a problem, but if you were to build with continuous variables, and the question would be which entropy, right? Under which reparameterization, which is, was a very nice article a couple of years ago by Rafi Levin on that. So thoughts on that? Yes, so uh, maybe two things. First of all, uh, not subscribing to the religion. There was a reason for the choice of this. Uh, and in fact, thinking about this at the beginning, I did not think this was gonna work. So that was uh, very motivated by not so much just subscribing to the religion. Um, that being said, I was uh, happy to be proven wrong and saying that it works really well. Um, I am happily admitting to uh, all these things, right? So all th these are all limiting factors. This is an Ising model and not a POTS. There is no amplitude information. 
it is, uh, dis it is discretized instead of being continuous. Um, there are no dynamics in here. There, there are all these things that are limited. I wanna say um, the other side of here is despite all these limitations, because this is what makes it simple, right? And despite all these limitations, it's doing really well, which I think is, is, is pretty insightful. But I, I do think that, of course, right? This is not, this is not a mechanistic model in any way. Um, and you were just ch ca capturing some kind of simple version of the structure. Um, which means that we're not guaranteed this is going to succeed at all. But of course, all these things are definitely um, are definitely limitations yeah, yeah, in a way. Just that, at least in this particular system, and looking at these things, did not seem to limit us that much. But if we wanted to ask a different kind of questions, we, should, we definitely um, would have needed to change the constraints. And 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 if this wasn't working, right? So um, before we knew this was going to work, then putting in the relevant time scales and amplitude information, especially that this is calcium imaging, uh, were definitely things on the table and uh, were things that we're exploring. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you, Illinois. I think uh, at this time we should move uh, forward to the next speaker. Thank you. And the next speaker is Audrey. Yes. Could you please share the screen, Audrey? Audrey Siderberg. There we go. All right, am I sharing the presenter notes or the slide? Just sharing the slide. Okay, very good. All right, thanks um, again to the organizers for this great workshop. It's been really fun listening to everybody's talks so far. Um, so I'm gonna uh, talk a bit um, about uh, you know, neuroscience and large scale neuroscience again. So building on um, some of the same kinds of data that we saw in the last talk. And very generally, um, there you go. Um, the, the problem that you might want to, to solve when you come across a large scale data set from the cortex or some other part of the brain is given some information about microcircuit structure, how do you make predictions about dynamics? And so to, to kind of put a picture on that, um, on the right here, I'm showing an example of about 30 minutes of recording of a recording of 3,000 neurons in an awake mouse, um, and it's from the Harrison Carandini Laboratory. Um, and you can see that there's all sorts of interesting uh, coordinated structured activity going on in this activity pattern. At the same time, we have um, far more data about the specific anatomical composition of circuits across different brain areas. What this plot is showing is an analysis of um, single cell RNA-seq across different cortical areas. Um, so these are several thousand individual cells clustered by similarity in, um, in, in um, gene expression. And you can see that they cluster according to whether they're um, GABAergic or inhibitory or glutamatergic or excitatory. Um, and then there are finer details of, of clusters as well that specify precise individual cell types. In addition to this kind of data, there's also data on the rules of connectivity between different sets of cells. And yet, with this large amount of data, there's still nowhere near enough data to write down precise microscopic um, mechanistic models of a cortical network, and specifically, you know, one that would generate activity that, you know, really matches this. Sure, you could um, use deep learning to match it exactly, but it's not clear from that model if somebody then handed you, say, structural information from a turtle, which we are beginning to understand better, or from a lizard, how do you expect these dynamics to change? Or maybe from a more um, you know, medically relevant question, if somebody had um, a defect to a particular class of cells, how does that change the dynamics and how do you 
um, how could you, you know, rescue normal activity patterns? So I won't talk too much more about um, mechanistic models at this level, but um, one potential useful step toward understanding this problem is being able to write down some simple models that can describe the statistics of this activity. Um, and this is pretty much all I'm going to put about this right here, but um, you could read about it more in an archive preprint. It's not about this data set in particular, but it shows that a simple model with several dynamical hidden states that are randomly coupled to individual neurons, and then individual neurons can also have stimulus drive, um, can actually reproduce a lot of surprising statistical features of large-scale neural recordings across time. And this is kind of um, a perspective that I'd like to take, which is that starting from simple models, um, we can go surprisingly far. And that with neuroscience, instead of starting from the mechanistic and highly specific individual cell types that you find across different cortical regions and different brain regions, and trying to predict activity from there, maybe we need to first understand what statistical features are generic to large networks, independent of most anatomical details. In another kind of set of problems, we'd like to understand for a particular task or computation, what kinds of minimally structured networks could perform it? How much, how much um, structure do we have to put into the network in order to get to replicate the data that was recorded? And then importantly, what does such a model predict? So I wanna make this a little bit more com concrete and talk about a very specific experiment that you could imagine how this um, might appear in many different neuroscience labs. And in this particular experiment, a mouse is tasked with distinguishing between two classes of input. Um, the, and if it determines that it's from one class, it, is, um, it reports that choice by licking one portal and from a different class, it licks the other. And that mice can um, learn how to do this for um, inputs that are, say, a, a quick, a tone quick stimulus that has either low frequency or high frequency or visual flashes that are low frequency or high frequency. Um, and by determining some internal threshold to separate those two classes of stimuli. So what these data will look like um, from this particular experiment that was from the Churchland Laboratory um, they acquired two photon imaging data from the posterior parietal cortex of a mouse, which is a, um, a, a region in the mouse brain that is not directly receiving sensory inputs, but is thought to be involved with integrating some information. So you have a roster plot of some 500 neurons here. In this particular recording, a subset of these neurons are inhibitory, which they are able to distinguish using a um, genetically encoded dye. So the analysis then is to look at the activity represented in each row of individual neurons and to analyze how selective they are, whether they fire more strongly in response to one um, class of inputs versus another class of inputs and how that relates to choice. And these experiments showed a very surprising result. They showed that the excitatory and the inhibitory neurons were both selective for a choice and that reading out from either subpopulation was highly accurate. And also that there were subnetworks of correlations among selective cells that shared their, their patterns of selectivity. So a, um, a classic model for this kind of Sorry, this got cut off there. Um, a classic model for this kind of um, network is to have um, two separate excitatory pools that have a shared inhibitory pool. So here blue represents the excitatory, red inhibitory. And just to kind of step through how this, this model works, all of these neurons are connected within a circle, um, but it's not drawn just for clarity. Is that if the input is, is input one, the excitatory neurons will be excited, um, they'll be active, which will then activate inhibitory neurons, which would then suppress these um, pool two that is not receiving an input at the same time. So these would selectively fire for input one. In the opposite case, you would see the same or the, the reverse that these would be excited 
and these would be also active, but these would not be. And so the excitatory in, the, in model one here, um, the excitatory neurons are selective for the input, but the inhibitory neurons are not. And because that disagreed with what the experiment reported, that the inhibitory neurons were also selective, a second model that um, involves specific inhibitory pools was proposed. Um, and so in this case, um, there's some pool of neurons set up that is selected for input one, which is, has its own private pool of inhibition. So if these are active, these are also active and vice versa. What we asked was, well, in this particular case, input one and input two didn't really have any spatial differences between them. And they mainly differed on their temporal characteristics. Um, this is maybe a representation of if you had um, auditory clicks, the timing of different clicks would be variable on each trial. Um, but in input one, they would on average happen with a low frequency and input two, a higher frequency. And the idea was that maybe we don't need to have separate pools at all. Maybe we could have a single network that's randomly connected. And because there's some dynamical um, spectrum of this randomly connected network, it would generate selectivity between these two inputs. And so I won't step through all of the results in this paper, but um, one in particular, if we simulate this experiment in this random network um, scenario, and then just try to decode either from the entire population or from a subset of excitatory neurons or a subset of inhibitory neurons, uh, was it input one or input two? We find that in our random networks, the accuracy is quite high. It's over 80% if you look at all the neurons and the excitatory and inhibitory subpopulations are equally selective. Uh, this is for a single network. We can look at the variability across different random instantiations of this network that we drew. And in all cases, that trend holds. We can also compare this to what the experimental perform or the experimental recordings were. And in that case, the accuracy of a classifier that was trained on instead of simulated um, activity, the actual recorded activity ranged from 72 to 87 percent, which is within a couple percentage points of what this model generated. And so, you know, to, to kind of summarize, um, these results could be generated in this model two with specific sub pools of neurons, but it could also be accounted for in a random network model. And moreover, this random network model can generate, can make a prediction of how selectivity in individual neurons changes under different input con conditions, which could be tested. So, you know, why does this model work? Um, taking kind of a pessimistic view at first, uh, um, you know, the task was very simple. There are only two discrete choices. But of course, um, it's been shown, and this is just one example in the literature, that random networks can acquire selectivity for more complex stimulus features, such as orientation and visual cortex um, in this 2012 paper. Um, maybe another reason this, this could work is that this task is very artificial. Um, it's unlikely that any circuitry really develops to distinguish between um, low and high frequency input pulses. And so a generalized network that you can eke that function out of is going to be a useful or is, is just what you would expect to find. But maybe a, a more um, satisfying answer and something that points us toward where this model might work somewhere else is that the observed neural responses were very heterogeneous and broadly distributed. And that suggested that a network model that had some randomness in the connectivity may be able to explain those results without having to put in selectivity by hand. And so just to wrap up, um, simple models can go really far. And I think it, and the a challenge, it's, it's a huge challenge for interpreting large-scale um, neural recordings in light of all of the anatomical details. And that perhaps instead we should be asking what statistical features are generic to large networks and independent of most of those details. Um, and in other contexts, looking at specific tasks, tasks and computations, 
and trying to build the minimally structured networks that can perform it, and at all times asking what this model predicts. And so thanks to um, my co-authors, advisors, and collaborators, um, thank you for your attention. And I'd also just like to mention, um, I will be starting a group at the University of Minnesota in January 2021, and there are um, postdoc positions available. So email me if you're interested in finding out more. So thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Um, we're a bit over time, so we'll need to, to, to move rather quickly with uh, questions. So anything first, let's say, are there any questions from the panel? And before we go to YouTube, I will um, ask the. Um, sort of, um, I will. I will. I will see the question. Right. So, so with the. What you have uh, suggested is that the uh, models, the rather simple models, are actually able to explain data with very high accuracy. Right. Um, and so, does this suggest, in some sense, that maybe? the experiment should be different. Maybe we should be measuring different things, not the, not the stuff that we actually are measuring. Maybe there, that it's just a generic property of this type of experiments that there is not that much information there that can be, that, that requires explanation. Do you mean um, with the kind of task-oriented modeling um, or, okay. or either? Or maybe once you're measuring thousands of neurons, um, there is enough data there to to explain everything, right? You can fund, fundamentally, you know, you cannot predict the which specific neurons are going to uh, be responsible for the for, for, for the classification for the task, right? And um, if you have a lot of neurons, it's maybe not very surprising that you can just choose and pick and choose from them the ones that are that seem to be. Uh, predictive of the behavior, right? So maybe not much to be surprised by, and maybe just experiments are measure too much stuff and allow us theories too much freedom to play with. <laughs> I think that um, that is a is a possibility. Um, I, I think certainly with um, the very simple two choice kind of task, it's, um, th there is a lot of freedom. There are, there are dozens, probably hundreds of networks that could solve that and potentially even explain the data. So um, maybe the, the problem is really to design something that, um, I, you know, either searches for what's common across different um, brain regions, common across different species, common across different individuals, um, or making more complex um, tasks or, um, ex you know, behaviors that you're interested in um, that have, you know, temporal evolution. So the, the network that we worked with here, the way that we set it up, it would not do very well with very long time series. Um, and I think that, you know, that would be, um, it would start to fail there. Okay, well, thank you very much, Audrey. I think we actually are out of time. There's a few more questions on the YouTube uh, channel, but but we have to go to our last speaker. So, um, and Greg, the screen is yours. Okay. Okay, good. So, <clears throat> can you hear me? Everybody hear me? and see the screen. Good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first, I want to thank Ilya for, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here to have this opportunity to speak to you. So I want to thank Ilya for organizing. I also want to thank uh, Tara Ward for all of her help in, uh, in, in getting this together. Um, and, and the ideas that I'm going to talk about here come from lovely discussions that we have with our extended research group and, and community and a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about sort of emerges from, from work that we're talking about with them. Um, let me get my, my guys going here. So a little bit of background. I came from 
uh, actually from thinking about quantum gravity as a, as a graduate student to theoretical biophysics. And the focus in our group is really thinking about sort of how do we understand uh, organism, how do we understand biophysics, but on the scale of entire organisms, whether they're single orga organisms, as I'll talk about with, especially with C. elegans, or multiple organisms, as you see in this video of bees, which we have tracked with machine vision so that we can keep track of all the bees and effectively turn these into a bee gas. Now, I also know that I'm the last speaker uh, on a long and, <clears throat> and wonderful sort of meeting. I'm also in Amsterdam. So you can think of me as the banquet speaker for, for the meeting, except that since I'm in Dutch time, you are between me and dinner, not the other way around. So I promise I won't go over uh, because I need to go to dinner. Okay, I wanted to start off with a reminder, just so that we're all on the same page, of exactly how successful our, our predictions in theoretical physics can actually be in fundamental theoretical physics. So I think some of you might know this slide. It comes from the figure of the, the manuscript of the first published uh, detection of a gravitational wave made by the LIGO collaboration. And uh, if you look at, so LIGO, for those who don't know, is a kilometer scale interferometer. Uh, and if you look at the scale, uh, so interferometer is two long, uh, two long arms at 90 degrees to each other. And uh, they, they, have, uh, they respond differentially to optical paths. So if a gravitational wave comes along, then it differentially bends one arm over the other. If you look at the scale over here, uh, on the strain that they're measuring, it's incredibly small, corresponding to deviations on the order of the radius of an atom over this kilometer scale device. I think that's crazy, right? And the fact that we can make predictions using fundamental theories. In this case, the fundamental theory is Einstein's theory of general relativity, which comes from about 100 years ago. Uh, this theory uh, not only is remarkably successful in, in this quantitative sense, but is also kind of reflective of uh, this other aspect of fundamental theoretical physics, which is that it's also the simplest theory to emerge um, from general coordinate invariance or from diffeomorphism invariance. So that's crazy. And it's hard to imagine given the, the complications of all the things that were, were, built, were built of as living systems, how a similar approach could actually work at that level in living systems. Okay, oh, sorry, I need to move the, the zoom window here. So perhaps an obvious statement, but if you work in behavior, it, it, it wasn't actually uh, a decade ago or so. And that is that to do good theory requ requires good measurements. Right? So there's been plenty of, of observations and behavior where someone points an iPhone at a particularly interesting animal. You can learn some things from that, but in order to do the theory that we wanna do, the quantitative theory that we wanna do, you need really precise measurements. So one of those ways that we get these precise measurements is, uh, sorry, is that, is that zoom bar in the middle in the way of everybody? I, I can't tell if you can see it or not. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the ways that we get these precise measurements is that we collaborate. We collaborate with uh, experimental biophysicists. So these kinds of measurements especially have been done uh, in the lab of Will Rue at the University of Toronto, where you get these nice posture scale measurements of the movement of C. elegans. And sometimes we get ANSTI, and there isn't data for a system that we want to study. So in this case, we wanted to study the social behavior of zebrafish. Zebrafish, as other fish, naturally live in three dimensions, not two, where they're, where they're normally imaged. So in collaboration with Josh Shavitz, we then built an imaging arena where we can track uh, multiple body points on multiple fish in, in multiple dimensions. Right? And, and that experiment is just getting underway, but we hope to have good theory from that in the future. Now, models, so again, in, a little bit in the, in the spirit of a banquet talk, Models in living systems and complex living systems, I think, are different than the kinds of models that we would build in physics. So I don't think that at the end of the day we'll have precise, you know, we will have precise parameter values like we do for, for general relativity and so on. 
right? Rather that we can use our models, and in fact we do, use these models as, as interesting arenas to illustrate particular conceptual points. And then we can ask whether those are consistent with what we see in the data. So in particular, I wanna point out that uh, there's sort of three big pillars of theoretical physics. Dynamical systems, which we all, we all used to know as theoretical physics when turbulence was, was really big. Maybe some of us know less about this uh, than we have in the past. Statistical physics, everyone knows the Ising model, of course, or generalizations, and, and information theory, sort of the quantitative study of uncertainty. And in some sense, all three pillars of uh, this, these important aspects of theoretical physics are relatively new. And they're certainly relatively new in the context of high throughput data, or high precision, high throughput data. So actually, although you know, we've been thinking about dynamical systems for 50, 100 years, uh, understanding how all these things come together in real systems that are sampled, that are, that, are, that are sampled from data is something that's kind of new. And some of the things that we do in the group is actually try to push these, these our understanding so we can, we can mesh it with theory better. Uh, to make this a little bit more concrete, we'll start off with an example of how we think about systems. And that is uh, the low dimensions of worm behavior. And again, we're working on the behavioral scale. It's absolutely impossible that you'll ever get there from the ground up. There's no way, right? So instead we work on this, this posture scale where we think we have access to, to relevant degrees of freedom, complete set of relevant degrees of freedom on the scale of posture. Of course, they're controlled by, lower by, by things underneath, but we have all the posture that we need. And here's an example. So uh, on the left, you see a red square, which is the location of a tracking microscope. This is from Will's lab. Uh, and that microscope is tracking. That's where you get the high resolution images on the right. This is tracking a worm as it's foraging along in its two-dimensional agar environment. That's about 10 centimeters in diameter for that copper ring, right? And one of the things I really like, especially coming from uh, something esoteric like quantum gravity is an important and unsolved question is, Give, given that video that you see that, of that beautiful worm, it's clearly not random. It's not, it's not rhythmic. It's not obviously rhythmic like a, like a simple harmonic oscillator either. So how can, what, what kind of model would you write down that would explain that motion? That will involve a lot of the rest of the talk. One of the observations that, that we've made, uh, it's not unique to C. elegans, is that when you pay close attention to the postures of that worm, so writing down the center line of that curvature, quantifying the curvature as a center line, building a lot of examples, and then going all the way back to Ned's talk, doing the simplest possible dimensionality reduction you can, which is principal components, then you find that four or sometimes five components of the space of shapes is enough to capture everything that you see uh, in these two dimensions. And that's fairly generic for worms. It works for mutants. It works under a variety of conditions. One of the outcomes of that is, is actually not necessarily the four dimensions or five dimensions are small, although that's quantifiably true, but also that you can do a lot. You know, with four or five dimensions, you can fit the trunk and make it move, all right? Uh, this, of course, this idea that the posture is relatively low dimensional, much lower dimensional than uh, other internal things like your genes on your neurons makes working on this behavioral scale a really powerful, effective scale in which to really sort of test our ideas of building new, new understanding, new theoretical understanding of living systems. Okay. Well, if we're going to describe the worm in quantitative detail, we have some models in mind from our physical background. One, of course, is the simplest possible model, this, this simple harmonic oscillator for small oscillations of a pendulum. Of course, if it were that, I could learn those parameters very easily. It's not that. Uh, I can't learn those parameters very easily. And in fact, the whole idea of learning a parameterized equations of motion for C. elegans doesn't work so well. In fact, an alternative idea, which is paying attention to the state space, so that something uh, pioneered by Poincaré, the geometry of the trajectories in the full space that describes the evolution of motion can give you qualitative and quantitative information about the dynamics without the equation of motion. That's the approach we're going to take. We're going to ask, can we learn, that state, can we learn infer the state space of something like a wiggling worm from data? And the answer uh, is yes. So even though you have a restricted number of measurements, we're only measuring uh, 
posture, not necessarily uh, other underlying influences, but if you concatenate pos postures in time and you build a resulting space, a resulting state that is larger and larger dimensional until you've maximized your local prediction. So until you've maximized your local predictive information, that's what I mean by adding delays from uh, along the K axis, so up to K star, which could be typically be 12 or 13 in, um, in the case of a worm, then we have a new state that describes the dynamics that's sort of maximally predictive on local scales. And then you can do dimensionality reduction within that new state. And lo and behold, what you find, these are not, these are not static modes anymore. These are actual short time motifs. There's seven of them for a worm foraging on a plate. Uh, that describes sort of local, these are the local state space dimensions of the worm as it moves around. And not only can you count them, but in this case, they're, they're highly interpretable. You get two corresponding to forward motion, you get two corresponding to backward motion, and you get three corresponding to turns, all right? And, and that generalizes. So oh, that, was, that, was a, that was a miss. Um, once we have that state space, you can come back to these questions of what can you learn about the dynamics within that space? And one important invariant from dynamical systems theory is, is something called the Lyapunov spectrum. You might've heard about maximum Lyapunov exponents. They measure how quickly uh, two, two trajectories diverge. Uh, but if you have a n-dimensional state space, then you actually have an, uh, n, you have n of these Lyapunov exponents describing how an n-dimensional ball moves or increases or decreases in your space. In the, in the wiggling motion of C. elegans, this is remarkably informative. You find chaos, so you find two positive exponents that drive the worm in a chaotic fashion, giving you variability. You have three, you have a corresponding set of exponents that are negative cor corresponding to dissipation. And perhaps most importantly, these exponents come in a very particular form where they're symmetric about, about a particular point. So each is symmetric about a dissipative point. So each one of the exponents has a conjugate pair. What does that symmetry mean? We, that symmetry gives a strong indication that the biomechanics of the body, the, the elastic Hamiltonian-like deformations of the body play an important role in, uh, in how the worm actually moves. Okay, uh, if you want more details, because I went really fast, you can, you can look at that up in the, on the archive. So I wanna finish with an overall sense of where you know, from my perspective, where I think we are. And there's a, there's a great book from Arthur Kessler describing uh, a revolution some time ago, which is how we came to learn our place in the universe. And part of that learning process came from precise observation. In the case of astronomy, this is, this is from Tycho Brahe and very detailed, even though by eye, observations of how, we, uh, of how the planetary motions move. The next step was for Galileo and Kepler, who was able to distill those precise observations into, in, into laws, but those were still empirical laws. Right? The final step, of course, is Newton, which who not only can distill, not only can explain those empirical laws, but builds a general theory of gravity that, that, that goes well beyond sort of planetary motion. And I think so the where we are in biophysics is uh, mostly we're sitting, we're lucky. If we're sitting around in the distilled patterns and empirical laws side, you can you can either be pessimistic or optimistic. The optimistic side of that is that you out there somewhere get a chance to be the Newton of theoretical biophysics. So with that, I want to thank all my group. I want to thank you for your attention and everyone for having a really great meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Um, so let's always let's start with the people who are in the Zoom call. Do you have any questions for Greg? Okay. So, um, oh, Boris has a question, I see. Uh, so maybe, maybe I'll, uh, I'll do it. Uh, this business of, uh, I enjoyed it a little. Uh, so this uh, business of uh, chaos uh, and uh, positive Lapunov experiments. So, is this a uh, real chaos or just, if you like, uh, you know, the center manifold or inertial manifold? Uh, you know, I would imagine that the uh, negative Lapunov exponents are 
contracting onto this manifold and, uh, and the inertial manifold exists if anything, perhaps because there is a locally divergent trajectories. But it's controlled motion on that manifold. It's not necessarily. Well, that, um, that's an interesting. That's an interesting. Dynamic question. Oh um, well, so okay, a couple of things. So one is the the observations of chaos and the trajectories go well beyond just the Lyapunov exponent. So, for example, we can uh, we can find and use unstable periodic orbits in the in the worm's motion to predict uh, to, to predict back on the state space. So we think actually that this chaotic motion is being used. This is this is primarily an expo, uh, sort of exploratory behavior. So we think that this this chaos that is being used to sort of move the animal around in, in a fairly random way as it searches. When a stimulus occurs, you collapse along one of those orbits, you become a lot more stereotyped and you do something and then you go back to the exploratory, the exploratory phase. I guess I have a related yeah, I question. I'm, I'm, oh, pressing, I'm pressing uh, this point because uh, I'm uh, trying to distinguish uh, uh, sort of the uh, uh, flattering butterfly wings from the free will of, of the worm. So to what extent uh, uh, this uh, chaotic motion uh, resides in, uh, let's say, biomechanics or muscle dynamics uh, or neural control? Right. We're interested in that, too. And I, I guess I'll have to say stay tuned as we build up our, as we build up our understanding. Exactly. And I guess I was just curious also, maybe if you think about this as foraging or um, you know, are these transitions dependent on the environment, on the history of the worm? I guess I'm trying to understand what it's doing for the worm to be having all of these different uh, motifs. Oh, in, it, that's easy for, for this particular case. It just, it moves around, it moves the worm around the plate, essentially, right? So for example, it's, you know, the worm's not a bacteria, so it can't, tumble per se, it's got to go into an orbit that moves it around in a different direction. So, so in, for, for this exploratory, th these dynamics are simply moving it around the plate in a particular way, an exploratory way, stochastic way. So it's effectively generating randomness through this deterministic process. Yeah, and is that changing? Like, is it, are there circumstances where it will do yeah. forage yeah. more aggressively? Yeah. So on. Yeah, so it's it's changing slowly on the plate in time. It's actually becoming a little, let's say, a little less random in time uh, as it doesn't find uh, food on the plate. It can also change very abruptly if you um, or will more precisely zaps it on the head with a laser. Right then, it drops into a very deterministic orbit for the duration of that escape response. And once that's done, it's back to this sort of chaotic exploratory phase. So we have a question from YouTube from Navish Vadwar. Uh, Greg, can you combine your analysis with the power of worm genetics connectomics to relate the locomotion modes with the neurons responsible for those mo modes? Uh, kind of. So um, the the paper that I referenced for this uh, for this work is is coming out soon, hopefully very soon in Nature Physics, and. And we were able to, to use some of, the, some of the mutants that are available for C. elegans, which disable some of the inputs that we think the worm is getting. And that has very direct interpretable observations on the form of the modes. And, and so not fully with the neurons yet, but that will come. But already with, already with genetics, we can, we, can try to, we can try to understand the mechanism of, uh, of this behavior, absolutely. A okay. uh, question from uh, Tarun Mascarenas. Um, how does this analysis help understand the behavior uh, with some kind of a stimulus, like chemotactic stimulus? Right. So I think part of this is that it, it start, we're getting closer to being able to put uh, the worm's response into a control language. So that you know, here, once we have sort of the background set of posture dynamics, now, when, you, when, when a stimulus comes, whether it's chemotactic or otherwise, you can, you can study that 
that signal response as a control system within this, as a control response within this, within this background. I think it gives us new, new possibilities or new hypotheses for how a control system in the worm actually works. Okay, and I will add one more question from myself, right? From your, on your last slides, you were talking about three different types, three different epochs, right? So experiments, yeah. uh, technological series, and then grand series later on. Um, so right now, what you're building is very precise, very accurate phenomenological theories, right? Uh, what does the accuracy of these theories actually teach you, right? What does the precision teach you that maybe can help us figure out where the, the far end, the truth, the sort of the fundamental theories are going to be, or how, how would they look like? Right, so I totally avoided your, your advice for the, for the, for the meeting, because I, I didn't put anything on the same scale, but we could. And uh, so for example, we could use this picture to, everybody's heard of the run and tumble, picture of bacteria, bacterial chemotaxis. Worms have a similar picture where they, they go in a relatively straight line for a while and then they, they do a more complicated uh, tumble, but it's essentially a tumble. And out of this picture emerges a precise prediction for the statistics of those run, runs and tumbles, right? And, it, and they match, right? Uh, now to Leonoy's talk, I don't know how close a match, you know, I don't know how much we should trust. There's clearly some deviations in the tails as I think there usually are. But I think, um, you know, I'm sort of a fairly practical theorist in the sense that I, I avoided the large scale theories in this case, because I, I don't know, you know, what they're, what they're actually gonna look like. So I think the best, the best I hope for in, is that we generate really interesting hypotheses for how the worms actually work and or how animals actually work in these configurations. We move forward and maybe after a number of those examples, we can start thinking about what the grand theories are. So with that, um, I wanna end this where at one sorry at the cutoff time. Uh, I honestly cannot really summarize this uh, workshop yet. I have to process that besides sort of the idea of emergent simplicity, which has showed up in a couple of different talks. But I guess we will all be able to process this and summarize this over the next couple of whatever it is, days and weeks. I want to thank every speaker for the great talks. I would like to thank the uh, Tiara for running this behind the scenes and for students from my group who were you know, uh, getting the questions from YouTube to me. And of course, thank you to everybody who showed up and spent, a, spent their morning with us or evenings with us, depending where exactly you are on this planet. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elia.